Hello. Oh, let's see if this works now. So annoyed. So annoyed. Hello. I feel like I need to like sneak in quietly. Not say anything too loud. Don't press any buttons. It wasn't me pressing buttons though. Our whole fiber system just went down. Just crashed. 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 So I have been on the phone with our fiber internet people. Gotta love technology. So we'll see if this works. And if not, I'm going to take a nap. We'll give it a shot. Um, when it kicked us off and ended our time together, um, we left off talking about all, <laughs> broke the internet, all, all that, like, all those, the anonymous stuff and all that, all the, um, the wild stuff we heard of broke the internet. Or maybe it was Fur Baby's mom telling us her secret about getting her goods sent through Amazon. Maybe that's what it was. And they were like, don't want people to know that. And they just shut us all down. That could be it too. I blame Fur Baby's mom. Um, so we are back. It was the Florida cartel. <laughs> maybe Dean called the Fiber Network. That could be it too. That could be it too. We'll just create all of our own conspiracy theories. It'll be great. Um, so, I don't know. They're, they did whatever they do at the fiber internet place. And now they say that it's supposed to work. So we'll see how it goes. And if it kicks us off again, then y'all are on your own. I'm going to take a nap. We'll see. Um, so, we are going to pick up from yesterday because uh, we've got yesterday and some of today to cover um, I'm done grocery shopping now what was the name of the guy involved in that one? yeah Dean Smor Smoronk he's the one who owns the house where the two victims were were killed and found um, it's Dean S M O R O N K I think um, Crazy stuff, right? Crazy, crazy stuff. So, um, all right. We are going to pick up before it decides to kick off again. Um, let me hide Lucy Cam since she's hiding from us. Uh, we're going to pick off with yesterday. Now, since we've, uh, since we've got two days to make it through, we're going to skip some of the, you know, some of the, stuff that we don't morning, really necessarily need. If you could step and swear or affirm that the testimony you give to the jury will be the truth and the whole truth under the penalties of perjury. I do. Please be seated. Dean is not our bro. And that microphone, it works best if you keep it about six to eight inches away, so you don't have to sit too close to it. Good morning. If Good morning. You could uh, start, please, just by introducing yourself to the jury. My name is Thomas A. Andrew, A-N-D-R-E-W. And did you previously work for the New Hampshire Office of the Chief Medical Examiner? Yes. How long did you work there? 20 years. Was that up until you retired? I retired from state service in 2017. And what was your title when you retired? Chief Medical Examiner. What were your primary responsibilities when with the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner? Okay, we're going to skip through like the resume stuff. And with we to get the death. There are other duties than the person who has died. And that examination consists in several stages. The first stage is, now we're talking about the forensic autopsy. You know um, this part. Then anything that's on or around the decedent is taken off, and the decedent is examined a second time without any clothing. Jackie, do you happy eight months? Just like the first examination. Happy, happy eight months. That is documented with photographs or sketches or what have you. Then 
the body is cleaned of any debris or, or blood or anything that's obscuring uh, a direct look at the skin and is inspected for a third time. And it's at this time where you specifically document any and all. That's when I relocated to New York City to do. Was Miss Pellegrini's body wrapped when it came to you? Right. Yes. What was the outermost wrapping? The outermost of many layers of wrappings was uh, sort of a blue tarp that had, was frayed on, on one side. And I'm showing you State's Exhibit 48. It should also be up on the screen in front of you. Is this an image of the tarp that was the outermost wrapping of Miss Pellegrini when you examined her? Yes. Did you take this photograph? Very likely, although uh, it was a, a long, long day. And it's not inconceivable that a technician took it in my direction. I don't have independent recollection of that. But that photograph would typically be part of the autopsy process. No question about it. And is that a fair and accurate representation of how that blue tarp appeared when you conducted the autopsy? Yes. Okay. Was that tarp frayed at all? You can see on toward the left side of that image uh, and along the bottom there is some fraying of the, of the tarp material. Were there additional wrappings underneath this tarp? There were. What were those? Uh, it consisted of some uh, drop cloths that were, were stained with paint. There was a, a quilt. Uh, I believe that uh, there might have been some plastic wrapping as well. I don't have uh, the report in front of me, but it was several layers of wrapping. Did any of those items appear to have blood on them? A number of them were blood soiled to varying degrees. And are you able to quantify in any way how much blood was on those wrappings? No. Are you able to give a qualitative determination? A lot of blood, a little blood? A moderate to a lot, depending on which uh, layer of wrapping we're talking about. And did you eventually remove all of the layers of wrapping to uncover Ms. Pellegrini's body? I, I did, yes. And when you uncovered her body, was it clothed? Yes. So I want to talk to you about that for a moment, and I'm going to approach and show you exhibit 49. I know it keeps booting all off. I've, uh, it's so many problems. If it doesn't... And everybody in the jury seat. I don't I can't. I don't know. Does exhibit 49 reflect the outermost layer of clothing Ms. Pellegrini was wearing when you examined her? Your Honor, may I, may I stand this? I'm not seeing this... Yes. Tremendously well. Yes, of course. And there's a monitor. Let's see how we try to keep your voice up. Let's see how well it carries. All right. The council, if you have any difficulty hearing the witness, let us know. We'll get a microphone over there as best we can. And the question again? Uh, does that exhibit depict the outermost layer of clothing Ms. Pellegrini was wearing when you removed those wrappings? Yes, to the best of my recollection. Did that particular garment have any defects in it? Yes, uh, there were uh, uh, some defects on the front of the garment, but uh, on the, it was on the back that there were in excess of 60 different fabric defects that correspond with something sharp. And can you describe for the jury what the term defect means uh, for your profession? A hole in the fabric that can be correlated with something uh, that caused the damage or the, uh, the uh, rent. It's not a tear. It, these, are, these have been made with a sharp instrument. And did that outermost layer of clothing on Ms. Pellegrini appear to have blood on it? Yes. And again, are you able to quantify that amount of blood in any way? No. And now I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 41. several uh, or two surveillance photos uh, at the bottom of this exhibit. I do. And does the garment that the woman is wearing in those two surveillance photos appear to be consistent with the garment Ms. Pellegrini is wearing in this photograph on exhibit 49? May I see them more closely? Yes, of course. Yes, they do. I keep reporting the problem to YouTube every single day and take screenshots and show all that stuff every single day and they don't ever fix it. So I. And Every actually, I day. have a blown up picture, photograph of this picture as well. Uh, again, does that garment match the 
picture uh, from the autopsy. Yes. And now I want to talk about the next layer of clothing that Ms. Pellegrini had on. Did you, during the course of your autopsy, remove that outer garment? Yes. And now I'm going to show you exhibit 50. Ms. Pellegrini had on under that first garment? Yes. And does this uh, sweater or shirt appear to be a gray color with some writing on it? Yes, there's writing on the left sleeve that I can see. And did this garment have any defects on it? Yes. Uh, similarly, uh, a small number in the front, as I recall, but the, uh, the majority, the decided majority, wore defects of the, of the back of the garment. And I'm going to go back, uh, and I'll put it up on the screen, to that photo uh, from Exhibit 41. Uh, you can see, circled in blue, it looks like there's a string on the surveillance photo. Do you see strings uh, on the garment from Exhibit 50 up there? Yes, the, you can see the strings here, and you can also see that, that black design on the front of that garment. Okay. And do the design and the strings in Exhibit 50 appear to be consistent with what the woman is wearing in the surveillance photo? They are consistent with that, yes. So now I want to move to the next layer of clothing, and I'm going to show you Exhibit 51. Does this Exhibit 51 depict the layer of clothing Ms. Pellegrini was wearing underneath that gray garment we just talked about? It does. Uh, so this garment, it looks like a tank top. Did that have any defects in it? Yes, it did. Similarly, uh, 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 there, there may have been a defect up toward the top, but most of the defects were on the back of the garment. And I'm going to show you another picture from State's Exhibit 41. Circled in uh, purple down on the bottom left there, it looks like there's a, a shirt with sort of a multicolored print on it. Could that print be consistent with the print at the top of that tank top in Exhibit 51? It compares favorably with this area of the print. During the autopsy of Ms. Pellegrini, did you conduct both an internal and an external examination of her body? I did. And did you locate any injuries during that examination? Yes. And you mentioned earlier, uh, talking about the autopsy process, that you document injuries through photographs and sketching? Yes. So I want to talk with you now about State's Exhibits 58 and 59. Start with 58. And is this one of those diagrams that you would use as part of your autopsy process? It is. And to be clear, you didn't draw the, the skulls on here, right? That's a stock diagram? Yes. And then do you indicate where you discover injuries within that diagram? I do. And I'm going to now show you Exhibit 59. Uh, we'll come back to it in a minute. But again, is this a stock diagram that you use during the course of your autopsy? Yes. And you document the injuries on this diagram? Yes. We see some writing um, in the middle here. It has some names. Uh, on the bottom it says anchor and there's a T that's circled. Do you document other things besides injuries during your autopsy? By my own personal convention, if, I, if there is a tattoo on an individual, I simply indicate with a T, the circle around it, that there is a tattoo in that area. Sometimes I will make notes as to what's on the tattoo, but it is, more, it is described in more detail in the actual autopsy report. That's what those things are referring to. We're going to go back to 58 and focus on that one for now. So can you discuss with us the specific injuries you found to Ms. Pellegrini's body, specifically talking uh, about her head with that diagram? This diagram is of the floor of the skull. So the, the top cap of the skull you know, has been removed, and the brain has been removed. So actually what you're looking at is the floor of the skull where the brain sits. These dark lines, which are what I added to the diagram, represent fractures of the bones of the roof of the orbit. The eyes that are just underneath this bone here. So these fractures correspond to an external injury that was seen on Ms. Pellegrini's 
four hit areas. So you're, you were able to tell that Ms. Pellegrini was struck in the head? Yes. Could you tell how many times she was struck? It's my recollection with Ms. Pellegrini that, she, that there were three distinct injuries. And all I can say is that she was struck at least three times. I can't rule out whether or not she was struck more than that. And can you tell from your autopsy what she was struck with? No. Why not? Sometimes you can make an opinion or you can draw an opinion on what specifically caused a blunt injury because it leaves behind a, a, a very su uh, suggestive shape or pattern behind uh, a certain kind of tool, uh, for example, or a, 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 a something long and thin like a pool cue. None of those signs were evident on these blunt impact injuries, and I have no opinion as to what caused them. And you mentioned the fracture uh, already, but can you, using that exhibit, describe the injuries you found to Ms. Pellegrini's head? Including the external injury? Yes. Or, or, or related simply to the skull? Uh, internal and external, please. With relationship to this in specific, there was a laceration, which is a tearing of the skin, and that's what happens if there's blunt impact against a bony prominence like that. The skin will tear. And it, 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 you know, there was a tear of the skin just above her left orbit, right around here. And so that, that bony edge lacerated the skin. And there was enough force transmitted that the actual orbit itself was fractured. The force of that fracture was such that it caused a fracture, a fracture line to propagate or extend through the floor of the skull in the front part of the skull. There was another laceration up higher toward the center of her forehead that was not associated with a fracture, as I recall. And I believe there was one toward the back of her head with one fracture. The only other external injury of the head that I recall was uh, that her nose was really purple, and you could, you could uh, easily detect by just feeling that there were multiple fractures of her nasal bones. Did you observe during your autopsy any bleeding uh, on the surface of the skull or under the lining of the skull? In both places, yes. Are you able to tell whether Ms. Pellegrini was alive when she sustained those injuries to her head? She was alive. Can you tell us how you were able to determine that? Well, you just asked about bleeding. If you have bleeding in response to an injury, the inference that can be made is that you had a blood pressure. You had blood being pumped through the body under pressure that forced it out of the blood vessels where the injury was and into the surrounding tissues. So the presence of bleeding in association with the head injuries and the, and the trauma to the nose is consistent with Ms. Pellegrini been, being alive at the time of these injuries. Can you tell whether Ms. Pellegrini was conscious when she sustained these injuries? Well, certainly not before, but, uh, 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 or excuse me, she, she was certainly conscious before, but I can't tell one, the order of these injuries and which, if any, caused unconsciousness. They certainly, particularly the one associated with the fracture, certainly has the potential to produce unconsciousness. And these head injuries that we've been discussing so far, were any of them fatal? The one associated with the fracture is bad. I mean, I wouldn't want to have it. But uh, I don't think that any of the head injuries per se that I saw uh, were necessarily fatal. And I did not include the head injuries under Ms. Pellegrini's cause of death. Did you observe other injuries to Ms. Pellegrini's body? Yes. In general, what were those? Stab wounds. So I'm going to switch now to exhibit 59. Uh, the earlier stream, they said that he had, that was 2019, so he might be out by now. I haven't pulled. I started dealing with internet issues. Did you document on? Okay. Before we begin, may I correct the record, please? Sure. I described three blunt impact injuries of the head and said that there was one on the back of Ms. Pellegrini's head. That's not accurate. The three are the one in the forehead that I described the one near the orbit, and the third would have been that injury of the nose. There's no injury in the back of Ms. Pellegrini's head. Okay, thank you. Uh, so on Exhibit 59, did you document every stab wound that you observed on Ms. Pellegrini's body during the autopsy? Yes, sir. And how many stab wounds did you observe in total? 
In total, I believe there were 43. Did you find stab wounds to Miss Pellegrini's anterior neck? Yes. What does anterior mean? Anterior is front, posterior is back. And using uh, Exhibit 59, can you just tell the jurors how many you located and indicate where they were? These injuries have labels to them. I used letters. It doesn't mean I know the sequence of these injuries. I just put the letters on them to, to identify. But injuries D, C, and to some extent E represent a series of stab wounds going down the front of the left side of the neck, down to the base of the neck, just around the collar. Were there stab wounds that you located on Ms. Pellegrini's chest? There were two. And again, can you show us where those were located? The stab wound labeled F is just above the left breast and be, be sort of between the top of the breast and the collar. And then the stab wound labeled G is just below and to the side of the left breast. Did you locate any stab wounds to the back of Ms. Pellegrini's neck? Yes. And again, can you show us where those were? Stab wounds I, oh, excuse me, H, I, J, K, and L represent stab wounds that run down the back of the left side of the neck down to the top of the shoulder. So from just below the ear down to the top of the shoulder. Were the remainder of the 43 stab wounds to Miss Pellegrini's back? Yes. Do you recall specifically how many there were in the back? 34. And can you indicate on the diagram where those are located? The stab wounds on the back were basically grouped from between the shoulder blades, the top of the shoulder blades, to just above the tailbone. So it was in that area that the stab wounds labeled M through SS. You know, once you get past 26, you've got no letters, right? So it starts again at AA and goes through SS. And speaking to all 43 of the stab wounds, was Miss Pellegrini alive when she suffered any of those stab wounds? Any, yes. Uh, can I say all? No. Are you able to point to any particular one or multiple of these 43 stab wounds as fatal? Are you able to point to any particular out of these 43 stab wounds that were fatal? Just the 43 on the back. Anywhere on the body. One of these stab wounds, can't remember which, one of these stab wounds transected the left carotid artery and left jugular vein. Both of those injuries would be associated with an enormous amount of blood loss in a short period of time and have fatal potential. There, of these 43 injuries of the back, 14 of them actually got between ribs and into the chest cavity and into the lungs. Those have fatal potential, once again, because of the production of, a, uh, of blood loss. Slower than this, but certainly the number of them would produce a lot of blood loss. There were too many stab wounds for me to assign a specific injury of the lung with a specific stab on the outside of the body. So I summarized it and said, four, of, these four, of these 34, 14 penetrated the chest cavity and into the lungs. Overall, more of the lung injuries were higher than lower. That's the best I can do. And speaking still about these stab wounds, are you able to determine any characteristics of the instrument that was used to inflict those wounds? In a generic sense, yes. And are you able to tell whether it was a single-edged blade versus a double-edged blade? The preponderance of these injuries, the decided preponderance, suggests that it's a single-bladed knife. And how do you determine that? If we consider what kind of knives you could deal with, there are knives that you would typically find in your kitchen that are single-bladed. Think of steak knife, chef's knife. It's sharp on one side, but the other side of that knife is blunt. That allows you to put your hand on it when you're chopping, for example. Killing knives or hunting knives, or bayonets or stilettos or what have you, are sharp on both sides of the blade. That translates into how they may look on the skin. A sharp, or excuse me, a knife that is sharp just on one side or one edge will typically have a configuration on the skin of being sort of uh, V-shaped on the sharp side. But as the blunt edge is going in, it leaves a flat 
straight across marks. So you have V-shaped versus a, a dagger, if you will. A double-bladed knife will leave an injury that is peaked or V-shaped on both ends because both sides are sharp. The vast majority of these had the characteristics of a single-bladed knife. And you said vast majority. Were there any of Miss Pellegrini's stab wounds that had characteristics <coughs> consistent with a double-bladed knife? I can't remember without looking at my report. And I, if I showed you a copy of that report, would that help refresh your recollection? What a concept. Okay. I know this is a lot of technical stuff. Does that refresh your recollection? It does. There were uh, in the range of six to eight of these stab wounds that I just could not tell. Uh, of those I could tell, all were sharp on one side and dull on the other side. Uh, is it possible that a single bladed knife could still cause something peaked on both ends like you described? Short answer, yes. But you want the long answer, so I will give that. Um, it depends on the configuration of the knife. Let's say you have, just for argument's sake, a chef's knife. And it's, it's very tapered. You know, it might be wide at the end, near the handle, but it tapers down to a tip. So at the tip of the blade, it might be thin enough or sharp enough on the other side that if it only penetrates a superficial distance into the skin, it can mimic a double-bladed knife because it looks peaked on both sides. Speaking still about the characteristics of the instrument that was used to inflict the wounds on Miss Pellegrini, are you able to tell anything about the width of the blade that caused those wounds? Only in a general sense, not anything specific. The, the length on the skin of the stab wound is recorded for each and every one of them, and there was a range of widths. It's my recollection, and may I please see the report, that it, the maximum was three inches. If I'm correct, you can forget it. The skin of these stab wounds ranged from a half an inch to a maximum of three inches. Can a blade that's a half an inch wide cause a stab wound that looks three inches long on the surface of the skin? Sure, if the, if the blade is moving or if the victim is moving. But the, the three inches represents a maximum at that particular depth of stabbing. Uh, that's all that one can say. I cannot say that the, the, the knife is, you know, two and seven-eighths inches wide. Have you had the opportunity to see uh, injuries caused by machetes during the course of your career? Yes. In your opinion, were the stab wounds suffered by Miss Pellegrini consistent with machete wounds? Not any machete that I've ever seen. Can you explain why? Machetes are not cutting instruments per se. They're chopping instruments. They are designed to be wielded with a sort of a slashing motion, not a stabbing motion. That said, their configuration is quite different than what we're seeing here. These are generally uh, instruments that are fairly wide and are fairly wide throughout most of their length, sort of coming to a, 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 a sharp tip at the end. The typical machete is not surgical scalpel sharp. And as such, it induces what we typically call chop wounds as opposed to uh, stabbing or cutting wounds. They, they have elements of both blunt and sharp trauma. And I'm going to show you now <clears> three <throat> photographs that are labeled States Exhibit 90, 91, and 92 for identification <coughs> only. Can you take a look at those three photographs? Do those appear to be three machetes? They do. And in your opinion, would any of those be consistent with the wounds you observed on Ms. Pellegrini? No. Moving away from the stab wounds now, did you note any fractured ribs when you examined Ms. Pellegrini? There were ribs that were fractured, but I can't distinguish between those being fractured by blunt impact or simply by the, the force of whatever knife was used to inflict all of the injuries. 
Okay. So you mentioned uh, blunt impact and the force of the knife. Are those two things that could cause those fractured ribs? Yes. Can you explain to us how they would cause those fractured ribs? Well, blunt impact is, is I think, easier in that um, if you have any kind of blunt instrument impacting the chest. Now, remember, Ms. Pellegrini is a very small-framed individual. She's, I think, 120 pounds, very thin. So if there's blunt impact applied to the chest, it can, just as that force transmitted inwardly could produce a skull fracture, it could produce rib fractures as well. From the stabbing standpoint, a fair number of these de uh, defects in the ribs were associated with stab wounds that went into the back and, and uh, uh, into the uh, pleural cavity. But you could also have the, the, the front of the knife impacting directly a rib and not getting inside the chest, but with enough force to fracture these rather thin, delicate ribs. So either one could have done it. Uh, now I want to talk to you about defensive wounds. Is that a term that you're familiar with? Yes. Could you explain to the jury what defensive wounds are? Defensive wounds are described in basic forensic pathology textbooks as a pattern of injuries that is consistent with a victim trying to ward off blows of some kind from their assailant. We generally see them more frequently in stabbing and cutting uh, homicides or blunt impact injury kind of homicides wherein there is a physical altercation between people. In the case of stabbing and cutting, we generally look on the hands and on the leading edges of the forearms to a lesser extent the feet and legs. If the person's on the, on the ground and they're trying to fend off their assailant with their legs, you might see them there. But they're more commonly associated with cuts or incised wounds in the hands or leading edges of the forearms as you try to avoid your attack. Did you observe anything that would be consistent with a defensive injury on Ms. Pellegrini? No. Do you have an opinion as to when Ms. Pellegrini was killed? I'm not certain I fully, it seems like a simple question, but I'm not sure I, I fully understand what you're asking. Well, do you certify a date of death when you conduct an autopsy? That I understand, and I certified her death as estimated to be on the 28th of January. And when you say you certify the date of death, is that a fact or is that your opinion based on everything you review through your autopsy? It is the latter, and that's why I put estimated on the report. If I'm, you know, if I know a person died on a certain day, I don't put that but this is based on the totality of the evidence as I understand it. And what factors do you consider when you're approximating a time of death? Time of death estimates are based on, one, investigative information, but as far as the autopsy goes, there is a group of post-mortem changes that occur in a dead body that are relatively, not precisely, but relatively predictable in the timeline in which they occur. And those things are rigor mortis, or stiffening of the muscle, liver mortis, or post-mortem settling of the blood, and to a much lesser extent in terms of its usefulness, algor mortis, which is the change in body temperature. Other factors can be um, uh, uh, brought into play, clouding of the eyes, uh, food in the stomach, if there is a known time when they were last uh, uh, known to have taken a meal, for example, and what that meal was. Uh, and then beyond those early postmortem changes, there are late, later postmortem changes that signify the onset of decomposition of the body. And can environmental factors uh, speed up or slow down those things? Environmental factors are one of just many possible factors that can speed up or slow down these postmortem changes, the, the timeline of these postmortem changes. So heat, for example, will speed things up, while cold will slow them down. That's why. We put decedents in a refrigerated area if there's going to be a delay uh, before examining them. Uh, are there other factors that could speed up or, or slow down? So for example, if, if there's a struggle, could that speed up those factors? There are many, and yes, struggle is one of them. Why? If a person is in a struggle, or you know, if they have a seizure, or if they have a very high temperature, anything that revs up your metabolism and, and uh, jazzes your muscles, those muscles are expending energy, and if you die during that struggle or seizure or what have you, that revved up energy of the muscles 
will make this chemical reaction occur much more rapidly. The chemical reaction that causes the stiffening makes it occur more rapidly, and the onset and then the decline of rigor mortis tends to be accelerated. So you testified that you certified Miss Pellegrini's date of death as January 28th of 2017. Could she have died on January 27th? I can't rule that out. So now I want to talk about Christine Sullivan. Did you also conduct an autopsy of Miss Sullivan on January 31st well, we saw 31st the video of footage of her, right? I did. And based on that and autopsy that and the factors that you've already described, did you reach an opinion to the date Miss Sullivan died? I certified her death as on the 28th as well. And was that certification also an estimate based on the factors we just went through? Yes. Could Miss Sullivan have died on January 27th? I cannot rule that out. And when Miss Sullivan's body came to you for the autopsy, was it also wrapped in outer layers? Yes. How was it wrapped? This wrapping, I think, the most external one was a drop cloth, kind of a paint stained drop cloth, and there may have been a couple of them in there. She had more plastic involved. There was a black plastic bag or black plastic of some kind that was on her. And there was also another plastic bag that was largely over her head. Um, I believe that was it. Did you notice any blood staining on these wrappings? Similar to Ms. Pellegrini, there were varying degrees of blood soiling on the different layers. Did you remove those wrappings from Ms. Sullivan's body? Yes. And was Ms. Sullivan clothed beneath those wrappings? Yes. And I'm going to talk about the clothing for Ms. Sullivan, and I'm going to start by showing you. wearing on the top portion of her body when you removed those wrappings? Yes. Okay. Does that appear to be a, a sweater of some sort? Yes. Did you observe any defects in that sweater? Yes, there were several on the front of the sweater. And did that sweater appear to be bloody? Yes, it did. And now I'm going to show you States Exhibit 40. And again, if you could compare the two surveillance photos at the bottom of that exhibit to exhibit 53, does the uh, garment the woman in the surveillance photo is wearing on her upper body appear consistent with exhibit 53? It does. And I'll show you, again, a blown up uh, footage picture for the jury again. Does that upper gar garment on the upper body appear consistent with exhibit 53? It does. And now I'm going to show you exhibit 54. Does it exhibit to move those wrappings? Yes. Skip through and it looks like the left leg of the pants is darker than the right leg. Was that due to the blood soiling? Yes. And looking back uh, at that same photo from Exhibit 40, is there anything inconsistent with the pants the woman in the photo is wearing and the pants that were on Miss Sullivan when you examined her? Jeans are jeans. There's nothing inconsistent. And when you performed an autopsy of Miss Sullivan, did she have on various items of jewelry? Yes. Did that include a pendant that was around her neck? It did. And now I'd like to show you Exhibit 52. Do we see that pendant here? Yes. And now I'm going to go back, or I'm going to go to Exhibit 55. Is that a standalone picture of the pendant you observed during the autopsy? Yes, the pendant was removed and then placed on this background in an image tape. So that's from the autopsy. And I'm going to go back to one of the images from Exhibit 40. You see something circled in red there. Uh, does that appear to be a, a large pendant around the neck of the woman in the photo? It does. So just as with Ms. Pellegrini, did you conduct both an external and an internal examination of Ms. Sullivan's body? I did. 
And I'm going to go through States Exhibit 56 and 57 with you. We'll start with 56. Is this uh, another one of those stock diagrams that you documented for Miss Sully? Yes. And I'll show you 57 for now, which we'll come back to. Is this the body diagram you prepared for Miss Sully? Yes. Can you use uh, that diagram to describe the injuries you located to Ms. Sullivan's head? Ms. Sullivan had an injury to the back of her head. This was a full thickness or bone deep laceration repairing of the skin. And there was sufficient force with this blow to the back of the head that it caused a fracture. It, it looks like a lot of different lines here, but basically it caused a fracture that emanated from the point of impact and then basically was propagated along both sides of the skull. So this is the left side and this is the right side. So the initial impact is here toward the right side of the back of the head, but the fracture lines propagated along both sides of the skull. And then it sort of broke apart like you, like you were, like a highway that, that divides. And that happens naturally along suture lines where the bones are normally separated. But that's what happened on either side of the head. Uh, there were also fractures on the floor of the skull over the orbits, similar to Ms. Pellegrini. This may have been more uh, related to some frontal facial trauma that she sustained. She had two black eyes, and her nose as well was uh, quite purple and swollen, and you could easily feel fractured nasal bones. So that's these fractures are probably related to the facial trauma, whereas this super, superferential fracture is more related to the blow to the back of the head. And did that, uh, did either of those blows cause damage to the brain itself? Well, this, this one was associated with bleeding in two places inside the skull. I'm sorry about the detail, but I mean, the anatomy is the anatomy, so I, I have to describe to you what I saw. The brain is basically protected by three layers of membranes they're, they're, it's the dura mater and the pia mater and the arachnoid mater. You know, the names aren't important. The, the, what's important is that there are three layers. And I saw bleeding underneath the dura, which is subdural hemorrhage. And there was also diffuse, extensive subarachnoid hemorrhage, meaning, meaning hemorrhage that's basically almost on the surface of the brain that was associated with that blow to the back of the head. And how many separate injuries did you document to Ms. Sullivan's head? Well, similarly, I think I only saw on my, or I only documented on my diagram, and hopefully we'll be seeing that shortly, for roughly three. I can, you know, say a minimum of three, but I, I cannot rule out that she was struck more times than that about the head. And speaking specifically about the wound, the head wound to the, to the back of the head, how much force would it have taken to cause that amount of fracturing and damage to the brain? This is a substantial amount of force. And that's because of the anatomy. These bones, for example, that are up above the orbits, they're paper thin. You can literally translumen light through them. They're quite thin. You, you can stick your thumb through them. It's easy to fracture. This bone in the back of the skull, the occipital bone, that's the thickest and strongest bone of all of the skull bones. So it takes a much more substantial degree of force to fracture it at all, let alone fracture it to this degree. So the generic answer is a substantial amount of force. Are you able to tell what objects caused those wounds? No. And are you missing those sort of physical identifiers that you talked about earlier? Exactly. Can you tell whether Ms. Sullivan was alive when she sustained these head injuries? Yes, for the same reasons. There was plenty of bleeding associated with them. Could any of these head injuries have been fatal? This injury has fatal potential. And speaking of the remainder of Ms. Sullivan's body, did you also observe stab wounds to her body? I did. And we're going to go back. Now. And you mentioned earlier you also documented the head wounds on this chart. Can you show us where those are? I referred to the two black eyes, and there's some you know measurements of how big those uh, 
those bruises were. The nose, that C-O-N-T means contusion, and I indicate that there were palpable fractures. This, is, this injury represents that full thickness, that's what the FT means, full thickness, laceration, down to the level of the bone. And that was the one that was associated with that propagating fracture around the skull. And uh, you mentioned that there were stab wounds. How many stab wounds did you locate on Ms. Silla? The stab wounds are lettered A through G. So that's what, six, eight, nine, nine, let's count. So. And can you show us uh, where on the diagram those stab wounds were located? Two of the stab wounds are on the left anterior neck. You remember that frame, right? So one is located just up underneath the jawbone and the other closer to the center of the neck. One of these two perforated or cut uh, the left carotid artery. There were an additional one, two, three injuries on the chest, two on the inner part of the left breast and one on the inner part of the right breast and then two lower down, one just below the left breast and the other one just beneath the ribs on the right side. Can you tell whether Ms. Sullivan was alive when she suffered any of these stab wounds? These likewise were associated with bleeding, so whereas I, I can't say anything about consciousness, she had a blood pressure and, and she bled in response to these stab wounds. And are you able to point to any of those stab wounds as fatal wounds? One of these stab wounds went through, well, I, I mentioned before, the one in the neck got the carotid artery. That's not fatal. One of these stab wounds went into the lung, through the lung, and into the aorta, which is, I believe it also got the pulmonary artery. So again, tremendous amount of bleeding. These are arterial blood vessels that would bleed a lot. And uh, again, another one of these went through the front of the low, you know, there are two chambers on the lower part of the heart, the two ventricles. One of those chest wounds went through the front of the right ventricle and out the back of the right ventricle. So it went through and through the heart. That one has fatal potential as well. And earlier, with respect to Ms. Pellegrini, we were discussing some characteristics of the blade that you were able to determine from your examination. We were able to make a similar determination regarding the blade that inflicted the wounds to Ms. Sullivan. Yes, I was. I, uh, it would be my opinion that it was single-bladed weapon. There was one very superficial injury that I clearly put down in the report as being sharp on both ends, but it was, it was quite a superficial injury. Were any of Ms. Sullivan's injuries consistent with machete injuries? No. Was there anything in the medical evidence that you reviewed that would allow you to conclude it was a different blade used on Ms. Sullivan than on Ms. Pellegrini? Nothing dispositive, no. Did you observe defensive wounds to Ms. Sullivan? Yes. What were those? She had two. Uh, there was uh, an incised wound or cut on the tips of one of her fingers of her right hand. I think it was the right hand. And do you want to copy of the report to me? Can't hurt to keep the record clean. Skip it while he's refreshing. It was really, it was really bruised. It was noticeably bruised compared to the others. And you could feel a fracture in the bone that was, that was farthest down. That finger had a ring on it, and the ring was bent, and the, the stone was, or whatever was in the holder there, was gone. Uh, I interpreted that as a defensive injury. And when you described defensive wounds earlier, you described it as sort of putting your hands up to ward off blows, would what you observed on Ms. Sullivan be consistent with that? Yes. So I want to uh, sort of summarize things up here. As a result of your autopsy of Ms. Sullivan, did you form an opinion as to the cause and manner of her death? Yes. What were those? I certified Ms. Sullivan's death as multiple stab wounds of the trunk with perforations of the heart and lungs, uh, multiple stab wounds of the neck and trunk with perforations of the carotid artery, heart and lungs. And I also included her head injury as contributing to her death. So both things, the stab wounds and the head injury, were listed as the cause of death. The manner of death was certified as homicide, death at the hands of another person. And returning to Ms. Pellegrini, did you form an opinion as to the cause and manner of her death? Yes. What was that? I certified Ms. Pellegrini's cause of death as multiple stab wounds of the neck and trunk with, and I included the carotid artery and the lungs. 
I did not include her head injury, and I likewise certified the manner of her death as homicide. If I got one moment, Your Honor. Thank you. That's all I have for you right now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what we'll do at this point is take our morning recess for 15 minutes. We'll return to the courtroom at 11.35. Okay. Real quick, um, I, uh, it's kind of hard to be like, um, this is very, obviously very difficult testimony. It's very, um, kind of, you know, uh, gruesome and, um, sad. Uh, so, um, I didn't want to interrupt this and be all like, um, Where's that notification coming from? What is happening? I thought I have all my notifications turned off. Um, I don't, I don't know. Okay. We're just gonna, we're just gonna pretend like we don't hear it. Um, so anyway, I didn't want to interrupt this part with, um, the like, yay, we're so excited stuff. Uh, so I wanted to wait until, um, that was done out of respect for what he was talking about because it is kind of difficult. Um, so, uh, we did have a few, um, anniversaries during this. Um, let's see, Allie B from Tennessee, member for seven whole months, seven whole months. Happy anniversary to you, Melissa, Laurie, member for three whole months says, yay, so happy to be a part of this family. We are happy to have you too. Um, and Martha Ivy, yippee, one month, <laughs> my one month anniversary, I'm a newbie. You're not a newbie anymore, Martha. You have one whole month. Um, and then I think the other one started before, but just in case, the other anniversaries you had. I'm sorry, Miss Johnson, member for 10 whole months. Marie Moss, our very own official statistician, just gave birth to her 13th year baby. She is a member for nine whole months. And Jackie D, member for eight whole months. So congratulations to y'all and happy, happy anniversary. I didn't want to do that while they're talking about like very gruesome wounds and stuff. Turn in when you're ready. Oh, so the podcast i see y'all asking the podcast okay so the contest um um the contest that we're doing so i um the uh podcast is posted on youtube on that list uh, so a lot of people have listened there um but the contest is specifically for if you listen on like apple podcast or uh spotify or anything like that if you um uh if you listen on there, just send me like a screenshot. Like if you have, hold on, let me show you. Um, like if you send me like just a screenshot that looks like this, like where, can you see that? Where it's just showing that you're listening or whatever. Um, send me a screenshot like that. You can tag me on X um, and I'll share it there or you can email it to me. Um, uh, the first 48 hours that it's been out, um, it's at like almost 4,300 downloads um, on there. So uh, I'm trying to get it to, my goal is to get it to 10,000 this week. So um, the sooner we get there, the better. So we're gonna do a contest. Uh, so if you send me that, then um, I will, uh, if you tag me on X, I'll retweet it and then enter you in or you can email it to me either way. Um, and if you leave a, a review on um, Apple Podcast uh, or Spotify, then I'll enter you twice. So send me um, the review. Um, trying to trying to get it to 10K is my goal. It's good to have goals. Oh, Evangeline Light, remember for 10 whole months. Where'd that just go? Oh, it moved. Where did it move? Oh, there it goes. Uh, Evangeline Light, love this group and learn so much from beautiful Brandy. Thank you so much, Evangeline Light. Happy 10 month anniversary. Happy, happy 10 month anniversary. Dr. Anderson, can um, we follow up on a question about the ring? About? About the ring? Yes, ma'am. Okay, did you, did you take the ring off of a I knew that was coming. I believe we had to cut that ring off. Okay. 
Okay, and was the ring, the finger broken? Yes. And it wasn't broken by you? No, ma'am. So, the, and you said it was indicative of a defensive injury? I interpreted it in that fashion. And one interpretation is that it broke when she hit something? That could that could be another interpretation. Yes. Another interpretation is did it broke when somebody ripped it off? Rip somebody broke her finger. In in what fashion again? I'm sorry. If she's defend, trying to defend herself, somebody could be grabbing her hand. Understood. Yes. Yes, ma'am. There's no way in how the injury happened. There is. No way to determine exactly how the injury to her hand happened. Precisely. All we know is that it happened in the struggle. Yes. One of the things you do during the autopsy is to set aside clothing, correct? Yes. Just to back up a little bit, somebody from the New Hampshire State Police is present during the autopsy. Yes, there was a trooper there uh, that was taking images, and there were also two uh, criminalists from the State Police Crime Lab to whom evidence was being handed off. Yes. So, back if you anticipated my next question, the purpose of their presence, in addition to taking photos, is also to take evidence. Yes. <coughs> and during this autopsy, you took a collection of pieces of material from the tarp? I don't have an independent recollection of that. I took the tarp off, imaged the tarp, but I don't remember personally taking a specific sample of the tarp that may have been done by the criminalists who were present. I just don't recall. And was the ring given to one of the evidence technicians there? Yes. And were fingernail clippings given to one of the technicians there? That would be a normal part of an autopsy like this. I don't have an independent recollection of it without looking at the report, but that would be a routine practice in a homicide of this nature. And when we talk about homicide of this nature, sometimes trace evidence of somebody's DNA can be found in the fingernails. Yes. Trace evidence of somebody's DNA can be found on the ring. Yes. Let's talk about the knife or uh, stab wounds that you looked at, correct? Yes. You um, find that it was probably a single blade instrument? <laughs> the preponderance of the evidence that I see suggests that, yes. And um, there's nothing indicating how whether one knife was used or two knives were used, correct? I have no opinion on that. And you have no opinion on the length of the knife? Correct. Because it varies depending on how hard the thrust is? Correct. And um, most of them were, were between two inches or three inches. I'm sorry, I, I lost you in the in the sneeze there. Okay, we're to the very depths of the statue. Yes, ma'am. Yes. In addition to sending off clothing or trace evidence, you also send off for a toxicology. Yes, case. yes, on both decedents. And um, and you received results of those toxicology exams. Yes. And. They told you that both decedents had um, evidence of cocaine and methamphetamine. That's not quite correct. I, Ms. Uh, Sullivan had methamphetamine and amphetamine. Ms. Pellegrini had methamphetamine and cocaine and benzoylacognine. I don't recall any evidence of cocaine in Sullivan. Not that both of them are stimulants? Yes, ma'am. So just to be clear, when you looked at the body, both bodies had an enormous amount of blood on them? There was a lot of blood on both bodies. And does it damage the body for any trace evidence of fingerprints and so forth? That is not my role. I do not, I may collect trace evidence. For example, I, there were some hairs that were taken from the defensive wound on Ms. Sullivan's hand, but I don't, I don't do any fingerprint analysis. I'm not trained or qualified to do that. Were you aware of whether or not anybody was there to examine for any fingerprints? Uh, other than of the decedents? No, ma'am, I'm not. So, um, your goal as um, the chief medical examiner 
It sounds like you're very confident in your scientific findings. Such as I presented them, yes. <clears throat> you cannot tell us how many assailants there were. Correct. You can't tell us the size of the assailants. Correct. Holly Mack, thank you. Thank you. Any uh, redirect? Just briefly, um, you discussed with 39 uh, the finger injury. What could have caused that? Could that have been a defensive wound from shielding herself? From the wound? Yes. Any recross? All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. You may step down. And you are excused, sir. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Matt. Good to five memberships. Thank you so much, Holly Matt. Thank you for just thank a moment you. and raise your hand the whole truth under the penalties of perjury. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Can you, can you please introduce she yourself to the jurors when you're ready? Hi, I'm Tara Ellsmiller. And where do you work? In New Hampshire State Police. And what is your present assignment with the State Police? I'm a detective out of Troop A in Epping, New Hampshire. And what is Troop A? It's a barracks in um, the State Police. Did you work in a different State Police unit back in 2017? Yes, I did. And what unit did you work for back in 2017? The Major Crime Unit. For about how long did you work at the Major Crime Unit? For ten and a half years. And what was your assignment back in the major crime unit, winter of 2016 going into 2017? I was a major crime detective. And what were some of your duties and responsibilities as a detective in the major crime unit back then? I was, um, we led, lead, I led cases, I interviewed, I processed crime scenes, and I attended autopsies. Over the past several years, how many potential or actual crime scenes have you processed for potential evidence? About? About a little over 150 crime scenes. And with respect to processing crime scenes, is that something that you continue to do as a regular part of your job with the New Hampshire State Police? Yes. And over the years, have you received any specialized training with respect to- All right, again, I'm sure she's lovely and has great training. We're gonna crime skip Crime scene process, awesome. Then it's shooting, and uh, oh. so I was in, um, my responsibility was to collect, preserve, document evidence from a search warrant. And were you the only evidence technician who part, uh, participated in the investigation? No. I want to go over various aspects of the case that you participated in as part of your role as an evidence technician. Uh, did you, uh, were you involved in the execution of what's called body warrants? Yes. And what generally is a body warrant or a body search warrant? So it's a search warrant that is on a person. We would take photographs, we would take their clothing, their DNA, their hair sample, fingerprints, whatever was in that body warrant described, we would uh, take like including cell phones. You talked about fingerprints. Are those the only types of print impressions taken as part of that body warrant process? We take uh, major case prints. And what's the difference between fingerprints and major case prints? So fingerprints is just like the fatty portion, which we all have, um, most of us understand that. If you get arrested, that's what they take. In major case prints, you're gonna take all the friction ridges, so it would be the, the fingerprint as well as the fingertip, the sides of your fingers, your joints, and the palms of your hands. With respect to obtaining print impressions in this case, was one of the persons who you obtained prints from through a judge-approved search warrant a person by the name of Timothy Verrill? Yes. And you see Mr. Verrill in the courtroom here today? I do. And if you can please identify him through an article of clothing that he's wearing. He's got a gray sweater and a plaid shirt on. May the record reflect that the witness has identified Mr. Verrill, the defendant? Any objection? It will. The uh, impres impressions that you took from the defendant, were those major case impressions that you just talked about? Yes. And what did you do with the major case impressions or prints that were taken uh, from the defendant? I collected them, I gave them an evidence number, and I submitted them to the New Hampshire lab. And when you said you give them uh, an evidence number, if you can explain that a little more for the jurors, please. Yep. So each um, piece of evidence that we collect, we give it its own identification. So I use my initials, TLE, and then a number after that. Over the course of this homicide investigation that we're going to be talking about, about how many separate items did you assign unique evidence numbers beginning with your initials TLE? About? Uh, a little over 500. And is it fair to say that you do not have a photographic memory and do not remember each one of those hundreds of individually numbered items? Yes, that's correct. Were numerous forms and reports prepared that documented those hundreds of individual items as well as your unique evidence number? Yes. And I believe when I saw you walk up to the witness stand, you had some papers with you. Are some of the papers that you have those reports that document evidence numbers and what unique evidence was assigned to the evidence numbers? Yes. What unique evidence number did you assign to the major case prints taken from the Pretty defendant, Mr. Barrow? Just one moment. We'll Sorry. hold that question. If you could come to the bench. <clears throat> Every time he says come to the bench, I always like get the feeling that like they're being called to the principal's office. 
Yes. So all those documents have been provided to the defense in discovery in this case? Yes. To the extent that you look at documents and you refresh your recollection as to the particular item number, can you tell what discovery page number you're looking at was? Yes, I can do that. And the question that I asked you when we were approaching the bench was, what unique evidence number did you assign the major case print impressions taken from the defendant? And if you have to refer to report, please do so and let us know what page number, discovery page number you're referring to. So the discovery page number is 007108, and it's TLE 503. So again, the TLE are your initials, and then 503 is the unique number associated with that. Yes. Was Dean Smronk another person who you obtained major case prints and other evidence from pursuant to a judge-approved search warrant? Yes. And do you remember when that was done, when the search warrant was done with respect to Dean Smronk and his person and property? January 29th, 2017. Were DNA samples also taken from Dean Smronk? Yes. And how were the DNA samples taken from Dean Smronk? A buccal swab is collected. And, and what generally is a buccal swab? It's a cotton Q-tip applicator, and we vigorously rub it inside the cheek of the person that it's requested from the search warrant, and then we bring it to the lab. And as part of that process as well, was Dean Smronk's clothes and other belongings taken from him on January 29th of 2017? Yes. Among the belongings that were taken from Dean Smronk on that day, was it include a cell phone with corresponding number 603-833-6735? I'm just going to refer to my, I, yes. I believe so. So it's 00617, um, and that is correct. And that number uh, on the screen is States Exhibit 24. And I'm sorry, is your monitor turned on? Oh, it is. Yeah. Great. Uh, there's a red arrow pointing to a number. Is that the number of the cell phone that corresponded to the cell phone that Dean Smronk had when the search warrant was executed? Yes. What unique evidence number did you assign to that cell phone taken from Dean Smronk on January 29th? TLE 5. Also, as part of your role in the murder investigation, did you attend the autopsies of Christine Sullivan and Jenna Pellegrini? Yes. And during the course of those autopsies, did you retain as possible evidence various items found with and on the victims? Yes. And what were some of the items that you recall recovering from the victims, uh, their persons as well as nearby their persons as part of that process? So we collected jewelry, uh, fingernail clippings, their clothing, as well as um, blankets and tarps that were wrapped around them. For each victim, did you also retain a DNA sample and print impressions? Yes. Okay, so this is the part, remember where they said in the openings that this uh, was one of the things that they said that the DNA that was under fingernails did not belong to uh, the defendant. So we'll see what they say. Did you assign unique evidence numbers for those items of potential evidence? Yes. With respect to the DNA samples taken for Christine Sullivan and Jenna Pellegrini, on the screen is State's Exhibit 61, and directing your attention to the entries highlighted in yellow on the upper left-hand corner, they've been enlarged here to the left. The evidence numbers on this chart accurately reflect the evidence numbers assigned to the DNA samples taken from Ms. Sullivan and Ms. Pellegrini at their autopsies, specifically TLE 155 for Ms. Sullivan and TLE 124 for Ms. Pellegrini. Yes. With respect to uh, print impressions taken for Ms. Sullivan and Ms. Pellegrini, what unique evidence numbers were assigned to those prints? And again, if you have to refer to your report, if you could just let us know what discovery page you're referring to. So discovery page 000563 is Jenna's prints, it's TLE 26. Did you say TLE 26 or 126? 126. TLE 126 is hers. And, and Ms. Sullivan? And that would be on discovery page 000564, and it's TLE 158. So Ms. Pellegrini was TLE 126, Ms. Sullivan was TLE 158? <coughs> yes. Also, as part of your participation in the investigation into the deaths of Ms. Sullivan and Ms. Pellegrini, did you process for potential evidence a house located at 979 Meterboro Road in Farmington pursuant to a judge-issued search warrant? Yes. And if you can generally, we'll start off explaining what is entailed by that process of uh, processing a location for potential evidence and what generally is done by you and other evidence, part, uh, evidence technicians as part of that process. 
So when we process a crime scene, it's done in layers, it's systematic, and we go from the least invasive to the most invasive. So we start looking, searching, collecting, preserving, documenting, uh, and collecting, put, making notes, and taking photographs um, of these evidence items. And as part of that documentation process, is there generally a written overlay made at the location? In this case, yes. And you also said that uh, photographs, what about videos as well? Photos, video, diagram, ferroscanner. scanner. What about taking possible items that may have evidentiary value? Yes, we would take samples or the entire object um, and collect that for, ev for evidentiary value. And what if you see forensic items like possible blood? You also document and potentially take samples of that as well? Yes. So over the next couple of hours, we're going to be taking a break and then we're going to be returning after lunch. We're going to be discussing the search that was conducted in that house and we're going to be reviewing about 200 slides. And the first of those slides is going to be States Exhibit 32, 32A, which is on the screen. Is this the house that you helped process for evidence in connection with that homicide investigation? Yes. And what was your particular role with respect to the search of the house? I was, my primary role was evidence tech. I did take some photos, but mostly the evidence. And again, what were your duties and responsibilities as an evidence technician with respect to the house? To collect, preserve, and document the evidence. And were you one of several investigators who searched the house and processed it for potential evidence? Yes. About how many days were you and other investigators at the house processing it, processing it for potential evidence? Four to five days. And were several hundred photos taken of the exterior and the inside of the residence as part of that process? Yes. And were those hundreds of photographs taken in the first few days of the investigation, which began on January 29th? Yes. Uh, states exhibits uh, 32A through U. We see 32A up here, but you've seen all the photographs that we're going to be reviewing later today, right? Yes. And uh, were they just some of the photographs that were taken by you and other evidence technicians as part of this processing of the house? Yes. Do the various photographs that we're going to be viewing fairly and accurately depict how the interior as well as the exterior of the house looked back in late January of 2017? Yes. Uh, with respect to the exterior photos, and we'll put aside the photograph in the middle for a moment, but the exterior photos show snow on the ground. Is uh, that how it appeared back in January of 2017? Yes. Uh, with respect to this middle photo that I'm pointing out with the laser pointer for the jurors, it's going to be enlarged on the next slide. Was this photo that's highlighted in yellow, was that taken as part of crime scene processing or was it just an overhead photo taken from Google Maps for reference? Hi, Michelle. It was an overhead photo from Google Maps. The other five photos, they, do they depict how the outside of the premises, the residents looked when you and other investigators uh, were doing that crime scene processing back in late January of 2017? Yes. In addition to taking uh, photographs like the ones that we're seeing here, as well as hundreds of other photographs, uh, were dozens of items of potential evidentiary value taken from both inside and outside the house as part of that process? Yes. And if you can give some reasons why items would be physically taken from a location as part of the crime scene process. So we follow the search warrant, but we would take them uh, for potential possibly testing them forensically in the lab. And in this case, to your knowledge, were items taken from the house for potential forensic testing? Yes. Were forens uh, was forensic testing conducted on all the items that were taken from the house as part of the crime scene process? No. And again, we're talking about hundreds of individual items were taken from the house? Yes. Is that unusual based on your experience that every or even most of the items taken as part of crime scene processing are not even subjected to forensic testing? That's pretty typical. For example, in some photos that we're going to be seeing after lunch, there are multiple items in a location that appear to have blood on them. Based on your experience, would forensic testing be conducted on each one of those items that appeared to have blood on it? No. And, and why not? Because it's very cumbersome for the lab to test every single item that is submitted to the lab. So we, we, do, we do a group of testing, and then based on the results of those testing, um, if it helps our, the case, we would continue further testing on more items. It just depends. It's, it doesn't mean we stop and start. It's just somewhat of a layering process. With respect to the uh, physical items that were taken from the house as part of the crime scene processing that you conducted, were unique evidence numbers assigned to each one of those individual items? Yes. So why don't we start with a general overlay of the house, if you could describe it for us generally. So it's a um, single family home, and it's with a detached garage and there's some outbuildings, but it's a two story family home um, set off the road with a driveway. And going back to State's Exhibit 32A that we're looking at on the screen, does this exhibit depict various outside areas of the house and their relative locations? Yes. 
So we're going to uh, I'm going to ask you to describe the location depicted in each photo, and we're going to start with the center photo that I'm indicating with the laser pointer. And again, this photo was not taken as part of crime scene processing, right? Correct. Uh, we're going to be talking about a main house and a deta detached garage. Where are those two structures on this overhead photo with respect to the colored arrows? So the blue arrow is the detached garage, and the red arrow is the main home. And where is the main road, Meterboro Road, in relation to these two buildings? It's to the bottom left corner. So if I continue down this driveway here, this ultimately goes to Meterboro Road? Yes. Uh, from where was this particular photograph taken? Closer to the roadway, Meterboro Road. And down we home. see in this photo the house as well as the detached garage? Yes. And we also see the driveway leading up to those buildings? Yes. This driveway, is that the only vehicular access to and from the house? Yes. Is this another photograph of the house taken from that area of Meterboro Road looking towards the house? Yes. Uh, looking at another photograph from 32A. What general area of the house is this? This is the back of the house. And where is the driveway as we're looking at the back of the house? It would be to the right. So this area right here that I'm indicating? Yes. And what about the de detached garage? Where's the detached garage from this perspective? So it would be kind of towards the bottom right. Down here? Yes. There's a car that's yes. highlighted in yellow and enlarged on the bottom right. Was that car parked just as it's depicted in this photograph when you and other evidence technicians processed this residence? Yes. Now, what generally are the three areas indicated by the red arrows here? So the one closest to the Volvo, that's near the driveway side, that's the, the deck. And then there's a covered porch in the center. And then to the left, that's the hot tub deck. And this is another porch area? Yes. And the last two photos are going to show those two outside porch areas. And let's start with that porch area to the right as we're looking at this photo. So where is the exterior porch and where is the enclosed porch that you referred to before? So if you see that glass door, uh, so you have a deck and then, you, yeah, to the left of the fireplace there, yeah, that would be the covered porch. Is there a direct entrance into the house from this porch area here? Yes. Are we going to be seeing that in other photos after lunch, probably? Yeah. Yes. And the driveway, am I indicating the driveway with the laser pointer? Yes. Turning to the last photograph from State's Exhibit 32A, what general area of the house is depicted here? This is the side of the house with, in the top right corner, that's the hot tub deck. Right here? Yes. And Meterboro Road would be off to the left? Yes. As part of the processing of the house at Meterboro Road, were several video surveillance cameras found inside and outside the house? Yes. And were those found surveillance cameras both inside and outside the house taken as potential evidence as part of the investigation? Yes. You know, I, I've been saying potential evidence. When you and other investigators take items from a residence, at the time, do you necessarily know whether or not those items do have actual evidentiary value? No. So that's why we say potential evidentiary value? Yes. When you and other investigators are processing a scene, do you typically err on the side of taking more and documenting more rather than less? Yes. And, and why would that be? Because a search warrant only allows you for a certain amount of days, and um, you want to collect as much as possible because we don't have all the facts of the case within those couple days or hours. There's, it's still being investigated. So again, we have been talking about surveillance cameras. You and other investigators actually took the, the physical surveillance cameras. In addition to the... Oh, hold on. Um, just developing, just developing testimony. Yeah, it's allowable. Go ahead. In addition to the cameras, was a central surveillance system control unit also recovered from the house? Yes. And generally, where from inside the house was that central security camera control unit found? We call it like the finished basement office portion of the first floor. And are we going to be seeing photographs of that area later on in your testimony? Yes. So on the screen next is State's Exhibit 30W. Uh, one of the still photos from that exhibit is enlarged on the lower left. From your time spent processing 979 Meterboro Road, are you familiar with the location inside the house depicted in these surveillance stills? Yes. In relation to the location depicted in this photo on the lower left, where was the surveillance video camera central control unit found by you and other investigators? Through, in the direction through the doorway where... So over in this area right here? Yes. Was that control unit also taken as potential evidence as part of the investigation? Yes. And what unique evidence number was assigned to that recovered central control unit? And I see you looking at some documents, so go ahead to do so. Does hearing so that it's on page, uh, discovery page. Does hearing that stuff that we um, read before we started, does that 
make any of y'all kind of look at any of this differently, like as a as a potential like hit, as they were alleging, instead of just him being like methed out and paranoid. Zero 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 five zero three, and it's T L E seventy. So going back to surveillance camera recovered from inside and outside the home, the state's exhibit 32B depict where those six cameras were found. Yes. And I think to go through the individual photographs on this slide, it's going to take us beyond 1215, Judge. So do you want us to continue or you want us so to So we can take the, uh, the noon hour now. So folks, let's try to uh, be back in the courtroom for a 110 start. All right. So 110 p.m. Thank you. Please rise. Yeah, it's, it's different, right? It's hard not to hear some of that and be like, oh. Please rise, Jordan. And to be clear, I don't know if it, you know, I don't, I don't know enough. I, this is not obviously a deep dive. This is one that we just jumped into because y'all wanted to watch it, but. So y'all know. Uh, Attorney Hinckley, whenever you're ready. As Thank much you. or more uh, about it. Before we than broke I for lunch, we were discussing surveillance cameras that were found outside and inside the house. We had 32B states exhibit, and focusing on the center photograph, which is that Google photograph we've seen before. And what do those six colored circles represent? Surveillance cameras. And let's start with the camera labeled one in yellow on the lower left. And is that camera's location depicted in the two photos highlighted in yellow on the bottom left here? Yes. And the photo on the right? Linda, uh, thank you. What are we looking at here? That is the front of the house. So this is from the area of Meterboro Road that we're looking at the house at? Yes. And on the upper right-hand corner of the house is something circled in yellow. What's the object circled in yellow? That's a surveillance camera. And where generally was that camera pointed towards? Towards the driveway and street. Okay, for this part, do y'all want to watch it a little bit faster? Because this is kind of very tedious stuff. This next photograph, is um, that a closer view of the same camera in front of the house pointing towards the driveway? Yes. There is a yellow colored car, uh, car next to the camera. This part a little bit faster. It's uh, pointed out by the red arrow here, and it's been enlarged over to the right. Uh, what is this card with the number 196 on it? That's an evidence placard. But so uh, with respect to before lunch, you talked about when uh, you were documenting physical evidence that was taken, you had your initials TLE followed by a number. So what is the evidence number for this particular surveillance camera? It's TLE 196. Linda, thank you. And are we going to see similar yellow numbered cards in uh, various photos that we're going to be looking at this afternoon? Yes. So let's turn to the camera that's labeled number two in purple. And uh, where is that located on the photograph on the right here? So it's um, on the deck. And is it circled in purple? Yes. Is the photograph on the left here, is that an enlargement showing that camera? Yes. And uh, generally towards where is this camera pointed? The driveway. Let's turn to camera number three, which is labeled in red. And uh, where is the camera located on these three photographs to the right here? In like an outshed outbuilding. And is that outshed depicted here, here, and here? That's the same outbuilding in all three photos? Yes. And the next slide will be those photographs on the right. Uh, can the surveillance camera actually be seen in this photograph here on the left? No. And why not? It's inside the, the shed. And is it seen inside the shed in the photograph on the upper right? Yes. And uh, it, what is this photograph on the bottom right depicted? That's the surveillance camera inside. And uh, where generally was that camera that circled in red? Where generally was that pointed at? Towards the driveway and the back door by the deck. These uh, next photographs, do they again show the surveillance camera that's located in that shed area? Yes. On the outside corner of the shed, indicated by the blue arrow, there's uh, what appears to be a light. What kind of light is that? Sensor light. Which means what? So if you walk by, it'll turn on and off. Let's go to camera number five, which is highlighted here in orange. Is this the last of the exterior cameras that were found outside the house? Yes. And uh, is it circled on a photograph on the right in orange? Yes. And uh, the photographs to the right and on the bottom, are they enlargements of that camera? Yes. Where generally was that camera pointing at? That was underneath the deck where the hot tub was, where the um, Jenna and Christine were located. With respect to the hot tub, is that indicated in this photo by the red arrow? Yes. And we'll see it later, but generally where, where the women's bodies found? Right in this area right here. So we've gone over four exterior cameras that were found at the house. The remaining two cameras that were found and documented, were they inside cameras? Yes. 
go to one of those interior cameras. It's uh, camera number six, labeled in blue. And where is that camera in this photograph here? So we call that, that there's our laundry facility, uh, washer and dryer, and like the utility space, right, when you walk in that door. And is the camera circled in blue here? Yes. That same photo is going to be seen in the next slide. And you generally described that area. Did you say that there was a washer and dryer in that? Yes. Room? Towards where generally was this particular camera pointed towards? The back door. Returning to a photo from State's Exhibit 32, uh, when you say the back door that that camera was pointing at, what are you referring to when you say that back door? So there's a door right here to enter the home? That would be the door. Returning to the photo showing that interior camera that circled Welcome. in blue, there's a door right here to the left that I'm indicating with a laser pointer. So where does this doorway here lead? So that leads into like the pool area office space, the finished basement. And was the other interior surveillance cameras found inside this room off to the left? Yes. And is the location of that other interior surveillance camera shown in the photograph on the right circled in green? Yes. And the next slide is going to be that same photograph. And where is the surveillance camera located here? It's behind the binoculars, which is right here. So we, we see two objects here that's indicated by the yellow arrows. Are, are these the surveillance cameras or something different? Something different. And you said binoculars. Is that the item that's indicated by the red arrow in these two photographs? Yes. And the surveillance camera was located behind that uh, pair of binoculars? Yes. Now we're going to return to this interior location as well as so the other interior locations in the house later in your testimony. But first, let's return to outside the residence. With respect to processing outside the residence at 979 Meterboro Road for potential uh, evidence items, were any items found on the ground outside the house? Yes. And what were some of the items found on the ground that you remember? There was an orange peel, some blue like fibrous uh, pieces, of, and uh, some batteries. You remember some cigarette butts as well? Yes. Were these various items that were found on the ground outside the house documented and retained as potential evidence <clears throat> as part of the homicide investigation? Yes. In addition to various items found on the ground outside, were there also what appeared to be footprints in the snow on the ground? Yes. And what was done with respect to the possible footprints that were seen outside? They were processed. Um, we took photographs of them and we made molds with dental stone. And what do you mean by molds? So if you get your, to the dentist before you get your teeth, kind of an impression of your teeth. It's the same material, but we just cast that onto uh, on top of the footprint. And we're going to see that in uh, a couple of photos coming up, or at least one of the photos coming up. Yes. Were there also uh, several apparent tire tracks in the snow in the driveway that were photographed and documented as part of the processing? Yes. So we're next looking at States Exhibit 32C. Are these some of the many photos that were taken to document items and impressions that were found outside the house? Yes. So let's go through these individual photos, and we're going to start with the photo on the upper left. And what generally is depicted and documented by this photograph? There's a tire impressions. I'm sorry. Tire tracks? There's a vehicle on the upper right-hand corner. It's been highlighted in yellow, and it's been enlarged. Uh, what generally type of vehicle is that? A cruiser. So a police vehicle? Yes. Uh, it may be difficult to see, but also in this photo, is uh, they're documented some of the items that were found on the ground, cigarette butts and batteries? Yes. Turning to another photograph from State's Exhibit 32, what are the objects that are highlighted on the ground? First to the left, we have an object that's highlighted in yellow, and then towards the middle of the photograph, we have an object highlighted in red. Let's start with the object highlighted in yellow. That's an orange peel. And what about the item highlighted in red? Blue tarp. And did you find similar blue tarp material in other areas outside and inside the house? Yes. Uh, what is the building off to the right here that, that I'm indicating with the laser pointer? That's the garage. I believe this is the last of the photos from State's Exhibit 32C. What's depicted in this photo? Those are the castings. So those are uh, apparent footwear impressions that you talked about using a dental stone to make the cast? Yes. And what is the, what is the red colored material in the snow and what is the, the white colored material here? So the reddish brown is um, a wax that you spray down to help with, because the dental stone gets hot and obviously going onto uh, snow, it can melt that so it just kind of helps preserve the footprint in the snow. And do we also see some of the yellow tags that you referred to before with the exterior surveillance camera, I believe it was TLE 196? Yes. And you had discussed and we show, uh, saw a portion of uh, the, the detached garage at 979 Meterborough Road. Uh, going back to surveillance stills that the jurors have seen before, we're looking at now States Exhibit 30Q. One of those stills has been enlarged on the right. Are you familiar with the general location depicted here? Yes. And where is the detached garage in relation to this? So off to the left? Yes. Was the inside as well as the outside of that detached garage photographed and processed for potential evidence as part of the crime scene investigation that you and other investigators conducted? Yes. Now looking at State's Exhibit 32D, and does this depict some of the many photographs taken of the outside of the garage that was taken as part of that process? Yes. So let's go through these individual photos. We're going to start with the yes, photos on the upper the left. This was a photo that the jury found. saw before lunch. <laughs> and this is uh, towards Meterboro, I'm sorry, from Meterboro Road looking towards the house? Yes. And again, the object that's uh, indicated here with the yellow arrow and circled in yellow is what again? The uh, surveillance camera. Let's take a look at another one of the photos. This is another photo that was seen before. What's indicated by the red arrow here and the purple arrow here? The red arrow is a surveillance camera and the purple is also a surveillance camera. And the detached garage is we're looking at it straight ahead? Yes. What general area of that uh, detached garage is depicted in this particular photo? That's the back of the garage. So let's go to the front of the garage. Uh, off to the right, we see a car. It's highlighted in yellow. It's been enlarged off to the right here. Uh, what again is that car? A Volvo. And that car was already there when you and other investigators began the processing of the scene? Yes. What is the area on the side of the detached garage indicated by the red arrow? It's a covering. Is there a doorway into and out of that garage underneath this uh, covering here? Yes. Is that same photo, uh, is that same side roof and side entrance pointed out by the red arrow here? Yes. And this is the same car that was seen before? Yes. 
So for a frame of reference for the next photo, returning to this attached roof here that's pointed out by the red arrow. Sorry. Is that same red arrow pointing to the same uh, roof area? Yes. The front of the garage, is it to the left or to the, left, uh, to the right of the photo as we look at it? The left is the front. And uh, what's indicated by the yellow highlighted area here? The door. We've seen the same attached roof with the red arrow. Yes. You testified before about blue tarp pieces that were found on the ground. Are there any blue tarps depicted in this photo? Yes. And where do we see a blue tarp? Off to the left, highlighted in right, and right here. What did you notice about this garage door window as well as all the other windows, at least to the front first floor of the detached garage? They were spray printed. The frame of reference for the next and last photo from State's Exhibit 32, there is a concrete pad that's highlighted in yellow. And is this where that side entrance to the garage oh, that's is? That's what he said. Yes. He noticed that they had spray painted inside the Is that the same concrete pad window, highlighted so in yellow on the upper left-hand corner here? Yes. What was seen in the gravel that I'm pointing to with a laser pointer by this concrete pad? Pieces of that blue tarp. And can some of those pieces be seen in this enlargement here? Yes. I mean, they may be hard to see. I think the next slide is a further enlargement. And do we see some pieces of blue, what appear to be blue tarp? Yes. Let's turn to photos of the inside of the detached garage. On the screen is State's Exhibit 32E. Are these some of the many photos taken from inside the detached garage as part of that crime scene processing? Yes. Let's go through each of these photos, and we're going to start with the photo on the upper left. What area of the garage are we looking at here in this photo? That's the inside of the door. Uh, what door? The side door, the entry to the garage. Where there were some blue tarp pieces by the concrete pad? Yes. And again, with respect to the windows here and the other windows that we're going to be seeing in the other photographs, what, what is covering these windows? Spray paint. What is this a photograph of? The front garage door with spray paint. Windows. And as one looks to the right, is this the second of those two garage doors at the front of the detached garage? Yes. And is that other garage door further shown in this photograph? Yes. Turning to the last photograph from State's Exhibit 32E, uh, what is this looking towards? The opposite side of the second garage door. Going back to all four photos, in each one of these photos, we have windows that are spray painted over? Yes. With respect to the paint on the various windows of that detached garage on the first floor, what kind of paint did it appear to be? Spray paint. And with respect to color, did the photographs accurately depict the color of that spray paint, which appears to be green? Yes. Was any green spray paint cans found as part of the crime scene investigation? Yes. And where were green spray paint cans found? In that laundry room, utility room, right inside the basement. So with that, let's turn to the main house and to the room where those green spray paint cans were found. And on the screen is State's Exhibit 32F. Do these photos show the outside of that laundry room from many different angles? Yes. Let's go through each one of these photos, and let's start with the one on the upper left, which is a photo I believe the jurors have seen before. We've seen this actually a couple of times. Where is the entrance to that room where the green spray paint cans were found? So you have to go around the corner here? Yes. And for a frame of reference for the next photo, that, light, that lattice work here highlighted in yellow, is it also highlighted in yellow here? Yes. And we again have that object highlighted in purple. What's that object again? Surveillance camera. As one looks to the left from this photo, do we see that same surveillance camera in the car that we've seen parked before in several photos? Yes. So let's go back to the area under the porch. Where again is the entrance to the room where the green spray paint cans were found? There's also another doorway that's more straight ahead. It's pointed out by the green laser pointer. Oh, where does that lead to? I call it the tool room. It, goes, it leads to the other side of the deck or where the hot tub is. Well, why did you refer to it as the tool room? There's tools inside of it. Does this next photo show both doorways, the one in yellow to the tool room and the one in red to the, the laundry room that you referred to? Yes. Let's go to the last of the photos from State's Exhibit 32F. This is another photo showing those two different doorways under the porch. Yes. Uh, let's focus next uh, on that door to the left that's highlighted in yellow or indicated by the yellow arrow. Looking now at the photographs of State's Exhibit 32H. Are these some photos of that doorway and what you refer to as the tool room that that doorway leads into? Yes. We've already seen this top photo. Let's go to the other two bottom photos and let's start with the one on the left. Uh, again, the room with the surveillance camera where the green spray paint cans was found, that's off to the right here? Yes. And the tool room, is this the room that I'm indicating with the laser pointer? Yes. Next photo is going to be that room. There's a doorway highlighted in red, and there's also something on the floor highlighted in yellow. They're going to be enlarged on the next slide. What are the objects on the floor that are highlighted in yellow and enlarged here? Pieces of blue tarp. And that's consistent with other pieces that you saw both inside the house, which we'll see in outside the house? Yes. So where does this doorway to the uh, that's highlighted in red, where does this doorway lead to? It leads to underneath the deck where the hot tub is and where Christine and Jenna were found. So we just saw photos of the room that's indicated by the yellow arrow. Now let's go to the room indicated by the red arrow where the green spray paint cans were found. State's Exhibit 32G. Do all these photos depict that other doorway <coughs> and the room that it leads into? Yes. We've already seen the photo on the upper left, turning to the other photos, beginning with the one at the top center here. In that doorway that leads into the laundry room, it's circled in red here? Yes. Are these closer photographs of the same door? Yes. Well, we refer to a washer and a dryer. What's, what are the items that are highlighted in yellow here? Baskets of clothing. And the washer and dryer here as well? Yes. Uh, can the surveillance camera in this room be seen in either one of these photos that we're looking at? No. Uh, about where is that camera located again? What kind of locking system did this uh, green entry doorway have? A biometric, either fingerprint or passcode. 
Turning to the last of the photos from State's Exhibit 32G, what are we looking at here? That's the lock. Was that lock actually physically taken and removed from the door as part of the investigation? Yes. Going back to surveillance still, we're looking at State's Exhibit 30W. Is this uh, what you referred to as a laundry room, the next room that we're going to be taking looking at photos? Yes. Now looking at State's Exhibit 32I, is this some of the photos taken of that laundry room as part of the crime scene processing conducted by you and other investigators? Yes. So let's go through the photos and let's start with the one on the upper left. The white object here, this is the dryer? Yes. Now in this photo, the dryer door appears to be closed and the laundry baskets we saw in the previous photo are gone. Now can you explain that for us please? So when I explained at the beginning about how we do things systematically in layers, we just remove, like we, and we photograph that process. So we remove those laundry baskets after, and that's why you don't see them in this photo. And what is the object on the floor here indicated by the red arrow? A propane tank. Uh, on the screen is a slide the jurors have seen before, States Exhibit 37. Looking at the two photos on the left, the one here and the one here, do you see that propane canister in either one of these photographs? In the lower one, with the red circle. Uh, going back to the photo that we just saw, what is the item on the dryer pointed out by the red arrow here? That's a spray can, paint can. Turning to another photograph of the same room, for reference, the washer and dryer are still on the bottom left-hand corner here? Yes. And where again is the surveillance camera? Where that blue arrow is, above it. That same surveillance camera again circled in blue here? Yes. What is the object here pointed out by the red arrow on the lower right-hand corner? Spray paint. Is this the same spray paint can we saw on the dryer or is this a separate spray paint can? It's a separate one. Is this next photo an enlargement of that second spray paint can? Yes. Turning to another photograph from State's Exhibit 32I, the same spray paint can we just saw a picture of, is, is it here for frame of reference pointed out by the red arrow? Yes. What is highlighted here in the yellow oval off to the right of that spray paint can on the floor? <laughs> Trash bags. And you said bags, plural? I have plural? it fast. Yes. Speed trawling. Turning to another photograph from that same exhibit, are those trash bags again highlighted here in yellow? Yes. What is the object to the right of those trash bags that's pointed out by the red arrow here? That is a um, spray paint cap. Turning to the last of the photos in 32I, is that spray paint camp, uh, cap pointed out by the red arrow, the same one that was seen in the last photo? Yes. This next slide, it states exhibit 32J. Does it depict several of the items that we just discussed, uh, the two spray paint cans, the spray paint cap, and the two trash bags that were found in that room? Yes. Uh, and here, do we have yellow cards that indicate these various items? Yes. So going through the photos here, and let's start with the upper left. What evidence number is given to the spray paint can that was found on the dryer, pointed out by the red arrow? 57. So that's TLE 57? Yes. What is the evidence number for the other spray paint can, the one that was found on what looks like to be a stove? 56. So this is TLE 56? Yes. Taking a closer look at TLE 56, did it appear to have been used? Yes. And uh, what color spray paint is that can? Green. What evidence number is the green spray paint cap that's indicated by the red arrow? 54. So that's TLE 54? Yes. In addition to photographing the two spray paint cans and the pa uh, spray paint can cap that was found inside this room, TLE 54, TLE 56, and TLE 57, were they taken for possible scientific analysis as part of the crime scene processing that was done in this case? Yes. The next exhibit is State's Exhibit 62. Do you see those three evidence numbers depicted on this chart highlighted in yellow on the left-hand corner? Uh, column, sorry. Yes. Turning to the last of the photos from State's Exhibit 32J, in between the spray paint can, which is TLE 56, and the can cap, which is TLE 54, there were, uh, you said, trash bags, right? Yes. And it uh, appears that one is clear and the other is black? Yes. Were items in each of these trash bags, the clear one and the black one? Yes. And were those two trash bags and the items found in them also taken as potential evidence as part of the crime scene processing that was done at the house? Yes. Did you or another investigator document the items in the black trash bag that I'm pointing out here? Another trooper did. Uh, do you remember or do you know what unique evidence number was given to the black trash bag? I believe it was GMH 15. And with respect to GMH, are you familiar with an investigator, Trooper Hildreth, Gregory Hildreth? Yes. What about the clear trash bag that has a card here, 55? I take it that's TLE 55? Yes. Who documented the contents of this clear trash bag? I believe myself and Trooper Amateur G. And were the various items that were found inside this clear trash bag, TLE 55, were the individual items photographed, documented, and assigned individual evidence numbers as part of the crime scene process? Yes. And how were those other evidence numbers assigned for the items inside this trash bag? The trash bag itself is TLE 55. What about each of the individual items found inside the trash bag? So I gave them like a, a secondary number, uh, letter actually assigned, so it would be 55 A, B, C, until we documented all of them. So all the items that were found in this trash bag will also be TLE 55, but also have a letter adjoining it as well? Yes. So the next slide is State's Exhibit 32L. Are these some of the photos taken of items found inside that clear trash bag and their corresponding evidence numbers? Yes. So let's review these photos now. We've already seen the photo on the upper left. Let's look at the other photographs and we're gonna start with the one on the bottom left. Now first, what is the white paper that these various items uh, are on in this and other photographs that we're gonna be seeing? It's butcher paper. And what's the purpose of butcher paper and who put that there? We bring that um, for a clean surface to document stuff like trash bags, trash cans, things with lots of uh, items in it. So the white butcher paper was placed by you and or other investigators? Yes. 
And uh, are we seeing some of the contents of that clear plastic bag in, uh, bag in this photo? Yes. And each one of these items, again, was given its own evidence number, TLE 55, followed by a letter designation? Yes. In these particular photos, is it all photographs enlargements of the same item found in the clear trash bag? Yes. And what evidence number is this? That would be TLE 55A. Do you recall what TLA, uh, TLE 55A was? I'm just going to refer to this real quick. <coughs> so on 000505, it's a curtain rod packaging. The photos are enlarged going from left to right. Do you see apparent blood on this item? Yes. And if you can show the jurors where you see some apparent blood on this item. Fair to say more than one place. Yes. And when we say apparent blood, why are we saying apparent blood? Because a presumptive test in the field has not been conducted. And a presumptive, presumptive test is something that you test it and it indicates, or actually, why don't you explain that for us? <laughs> it uh, basically says that there's blood is apparent there. Hemoglobin is apparent. The chemicals allow that reaction. Did you also see apparent blood on other items that were found in this uh, clear trash bag, TLE 55? Yes. The next slide shows what you designated TLE 55E. Did you observe apparent blood on this item as well? Yes. And where is some of the apparent blood on TLE 55E? And again, did it appear to be multiple stains of blood on that item? Yes. The next photo, is this another photo of contents of the clear trash bag? Yes. And another photo, you designated this clear trash bag, I'm sorry, this clear plastic bag, TLE 55K? Yes. Turning to another of the photos from State's Exhibit 32L, there's a red <coughs> arrow pointing to an item here. Is it also pointing to what appears to be more apparent blood? Yes. Turning to another photo of the contents of the clear trash bag, Item TLE 55H has been highlighted in yellow, and to the left of that item is an item that's indicated by the red arrow, oh, TLE 55G. What is TLE 55G? Clear tape. The gold-colored elephant is enlarged in the next photo. And is there some more apparent blood staining seen on this item? Yes. And where do you see some more apparent blood staining here? The clear trash bag and its contents, all with associated evidence number TLE 55, in addition to being photographed, were they also taken for potential scientific testing? Yes. And in this slide here, do we see many of the contents of that clear trash bag with their associated evidence numbers? Yes. So here we have TLE 55A, TLE 55B, TLE 55C, TLE 55E, TLE 55H, TLE 55I, and TLE 55J. Do you see those same evidence numbers on this chart, which is State's Exhibit 60, highlighted in yellow on this left-hand column? Yes. What evidence numbers are labeled in these photos of the contents of the clear plastic bag pointed out by the red arrows? So it's TLE 55D, 55K, and 55G. Are those three items, as well as the clear trash bag itself, TLE 55, on this chart, which is State's Exhibit 62, highlighted in yellow on the column to the far left? Yes. Let's move on to the room that's next door to the room that we have just been discussing, the room with the clear uh, trash bag, the black trash bag, spray paint can, spray paint can cap, the room next door to it, going back to a surveillance still, State's Exhibit 30W. Again, describe the room that one enters as one goes to the right in this photograph on the bottom here. That's the office, the pool table, where the surveillance camera is on that wall. And is it also where the central surveillance camera control unit was found as well? Yes. Going on to other surveillance stills that the jurors have seen before, State's Exhibit 30F. Do the photos along the bottom appear to depict a portion of what you call the office or pool table room? Yes. The next slide is State's Exhibit 32M. Are these some of the many photos that were taken of that pool table office room that you've described as part of the crime scene processing in the case? Yes. Well, let's look at each one of these photos and let's start with the one on the upper left. And this again is the entryway into that room from the laundry room? Yes. And is that same entryway, is that here off to the right in this photograph? Yes. And where again is the surveillance camera in this particular room? It's behind the binoculars, which is circled in green. Is this another photo showing the general area of that surveillance camera? Yes. The so next slide will be the same photo. Uh, that portion has been enlarged. And again, this black object here is what again? Binoculars. The next slide is a series of surveillance stills that the jurors have seen before, 30P. And the yellow highlighted portion on the bottom right are going to be shown on the next slide. Does the texture on what's seen to the left appear consistent with the texture of the binoculars that were photographed and documented as part of the crime scene processing? Yes. Turning to another photo from State's Exhibit 32M, what are we looking at in this photo? It's two pieces of evidence that we were collecting and documenting. And what's this piece of evidence to the left, and what's the one more center of the photo? So the one to the left is TLE 71, which is a laptop bag, and then TLE 70 is the hard drive. The central control unit I've been referring to? Yes. With respect to the central control unit, was that found on the floor as depicted in this photograph, or was the photo taken after the system had been removed someplace by investigators? After it had been removed. And I think we, we actually see some white butcher paper as part of that process, am I correct on that? Yes. Uh, where was the central hard drive found by investigators? 
in the cabinet underneath the monitor near the surveillance camera. And is that the cabinet shown here with the red arrow as well as here highlighted in the red arrow? Yes. So it was this open cabinet door just as one enters the laundry room to this room? Yes. And in this photo, do we again see some more yellow tags documenting the uh, photographing and actual recovery of some items from the house? Yes. Uh, and what is TLE 70 again? Is that the mainframe of the surveillance of the hard drive? And TLE 71 is what? A laptop bag. Uh, was there a large amount of cash found among other items in this bag? Yes. In addition to recovering the surveillance hard drive and this laptop bag, did you also find in the same room and retain as potential evidence a cell phone that you assigned unique evidence number TLE 50? Yes. Turning to another photo from States Exhibit 32M, from what area is this particular photograph taken from? So this is if you were coming in the laundry room and you were going past the binoculars, you're looking straight into the pool ta table. In the pool table, you refer to it as a pool table room. Do we see what appears to be a pool table here indicated by the laser pointer? Yes. Uh, there are three areas that are marked by arrows in this photo. There's a yellow, uh, an area indicated by the yellow arrow. There is an area indicated by the red arrow. And there's an area indicated by the blue arrow. Uh, this yellow arrow, arrow is pointing to a door. Where does this door lead to? We call that the master bedroom. Linda, thank you. And why do you refer to it as the master bedroom? It, had, it appeared to have a lot of clothing from female and men. Um, in a bed? In a bed. The uh, red arrow to the left is also pointing to a door. Where does this door lead to? To the bathroom. And finally, the blue arrow. And what is the direction that this blue arrow is pointing? That is pointing to the staircase going up to the main floor of the home. So for a frame of reference for the next photo, some uh, these appear to be drums that are highlighted in green here? Yes. With that context, let's turn to the next photo. Uh, do we see those same drums highlighted in green here? Yes. What is the item that's highlighted or circled in yellow? Clock. The stair it appears to be a stairway handle uh, and a blue arrow pointing up. What does this lead to? To the first, the main floor of the house. So we, before we move on to another specific room in the house of 979 Meterborough Road, was the entirety of the inside of that house photographed and processed for potential evidence? Yes. So for example, the previous photo, uh, it was pointed out and you referred to a master bedroom and a bathroom. We haven't seen photographs, but were photographs taken of those rooms as part of crime scene processing? Yes. So let's move to another room inside the house, States Exhibit 32N. Are these some of the many photographs that were taken from another bedroom inside the house as part of crime scene processing? Yes. Is this the master bedroom in the bath in the basement that you're referring to before, or is this another bedroom? It's another bedroom. And where generally is this bedroom located? So when you walk up the stairs, you go through the kitchen, it's all the way at the end of the hallway on the right. So going through the individual photographs in this exhibit, and let's start with the photograph on the upper left right here. Does this photograph depict how the bed appeared when the room was processed by you and other investigators, uh, which shows no bedding on the bed? Yes. What is this object that's laying on the bed? That's a rug. And where is the entrance to this bedroom? Let's write. Where is the bureau that we're looking at in relation to the bed that we saw in the previous photograph? So you walk into the room, look left, the bureau's on that, on that wall. With respect to the jewelry photographed on the bureau that's highlighted in yellow, was this how the jewelry appeared in the room when it was processed by you and other investigators? Yes, it was like that. In other words, the jewelry hadn't been taken from the drawers or anyone else, anywhere else and laid out by investigators. This is where it was? Correct. The next slide is just of that jewelry as photographed as part of crime scene processing along the top. And underneath is part of State's Exhibit 45 that the jurors saw last week. And I'll ask the jurors to take a few moments to compare the photos again. This is the crime scene photo, and these are photos the jurors saw last week, State's Exhibit 45. Turning to another photograph from State's Exhibit 32N, where is the, the bed that had the, the rug on? Right as to the area on the floor that's highlighted in yellow, this, the next slide is going to be an enlargement of this area. And is that area of the floor by the bed depicted in the photo to the left? Yes. And what are we seeing here uh, on the floor? It's been enlarged further and pointed out by the red arrow. So what are we seeing on the floor by the bed? Those blue tarp pieces. And we saw some other photos. It was uh, outside the garage. We saw some blue fibers. We also saw it in what you call the tool room. Do you remember there being any blue, similar blue fibers anywhere else in the house? The staircase that we were talking about going up to the kitchen. And is this just another photograph showing further some of that pieces of blue tarp that was found in the bedroom? Yes. Turning to another photograph from State's Exhibit 32N, uh, we have part of a headboard here that's highlighted in yellow. Yes. So the next slide is just of this headboard that's been highlighted, enlarged, and isolated. And off to the right are photographs that the jurors saw last week from State's Exhibit 45. And again, we asked the jurors to take a few moments to compare the photos and the object. Returning to the photo of the bed, does it also document the stain on the bed that's highlighted here in yellow? Yes. With respect to that stain, was it photographed as it was seen or had bedding or anything else been removed by investigators before him? It was photographed as seen. And with respect to the rug to the right seen by that stain, was that rug on the bed when you and other investigators processed the house for evidence? Yes. And the next slide is going to show an enlargement of that stain. So that's an enlargement of the stain of the photograph that we just saw. And on the right is a photograph the jurors saw last week, State's Exhibit 47. Again, I'll ask the jurors to take a few moments to compare the two photos. As to the stain that was found on the bed, was anything done with respect to it for the purpose of potential further evidence processing? 
Yes, we took a sample. And how did you take a sample? With a swab. And what do you mean by swab? So we take, similar to the buckle swabs inside of someone's mouth, we have a um, Q-tip adapter. Uh, we apply one wet, one dry, and we enter the stain, and we collect it and bring it to the lab. As to testing of physical evidence, whether DNA testing or other scientific analysis, is that done by yourself and other investigators with the New Hampshire State Police? No. Who typically conducts such analysis? New Hampshire State Police Lab. And does the New Hampshire State Lab typically get access to the actual physical evidence for testing purposes? Depends on the item. Is testing also done outside the state laboratory on occasion based on your own experience? Yes. Turning to the last of the photos from State's Exhibit 32N, does it again show that stain on the bed? Yes. What is the object in yellow that's enlarged up here to the right? It is a um, evidence marker sticker, basically. Is there any reason that a yellow card wasn't used here and had been used before? It's just a smaller sample, easier to document. And with respect to the swab that was taken from this apparent blood stain, does that be TLE 51? Yes. Uh, we also see a similar sticker here on the headboard. Do you recall what that was documenting? Uh, another potential blood stain. Focusing on the swabbing of the stain on the mattress that's highlighted here in yellow, TLE 51, and turning to the next slide. This is State's Exhibit 61, which the jurors saw before the lunch break. Do we see that same unique evidence number from the mattress swabbing TLE 51 on this chart highlighted in yellow along the top? Yes. And is that same unique evidence number TLE 51 also seen in State's Exhibit 60 highlighted in yellow on the column here on the left? Yes. In addition to possible blood evidence found in this bedroom, such as the stain on the bed, were apparent illegal drugs and paraphernalia found in this room, as well as other rooms in the house? Yes. The next room inside the house that I will review with you is the kitchen area. And for that, we're going to go to State's Exhibit 32O. And does this show several of the many photos taken as part of, of that area of the house taken as part of the crime scene processing? Yes. And where generally was the kitchen inside the house? It was in the back of the house, which connected the covered porch. Reviewing each one of these individual photos, and we're going to start with the one on the upper left here. Uh, what is the item in the lower left-hand corner with the numbered sticker 63? It's pointed out by the red arrow. A vacuum. Uh, what is the item evidence number 226? It's hard to read, but it's a yellow card with 226 that's pointed out by the blue arrow. It's Alexa. And, Alexa, uh, I'm sorry. And what is Alexa? It's a cloud-based voice service. And from experience and also what you know about in this case, can Alexa audio record speakers? Yes. Was the Alexa device that was found in the kitchen plugged in when you and other investigators processed the crime scene? No. So it was not working and not able to record at the time that the kitchen was processed for evidence? Hold it. So the objection? Why don't you come up for a moment? <clears throat> for this stuff, because it's going through the pictures and we have all the pictures and stuff, it's just easier to do it a little bit faster, especially because we have so much to get through. It's not working. Uh, panning to the right from this perspective. And with that, we'll move on to the next slide. Are we looking at the other side of the kitchen? Yes. Uh, where does this window above the sink look to generally? The porch, the back porch. You talked about uh, in that laundry room area, there was a clear trash bag that contained various apparent bloodstained items, TLE 55, that we saw before? Yes. Were there similar trash bags found in the kitchen? Yes. And where? Uh, for perspective for the next photo, uh, we're looking at here to the right that I'm pointing out with a laser pointer. Is that a refrigerator? Yes. So with that context, let's look at the next photo. Is that same refrigerator seen more in the middle of the photograph that I'm pointing out with the laser pointer? Yes. Uh, focusing on the orange colored rug in the bottom of the photo to the right of the refrigerator highlighted in yellow here, uh, where is that rug in this photo? And the white object to the left of the rug is what? And uh, what kind of door is this just past that orange rug? A glass slider door to the porch. And where does this door lead to? What is this area that I'm indicating with the green laser pointer? That's the porch. And when you say the porch, is that the yellow highlighted area that's shown on this photograph? Yes. While processing the kitchen area of the house, did you uh, observe any apparent bloodstains on or near this refrigerator off to the left here? Yes. And turning to the last two photos from State's Exhibit 32O, did they document some of that apparent blood found on and nearby that refrigerator? Yes. Uh, was it a single stain of apparent blood that was observed or multiple apparent blood stains? Multiple. And uh, what's indicated by the yellow highlighted areas on these photos here? Just like in the bedroom, these are stickers that are evidence markers. Are some of those apparent blood stains seen on the seen better on the enlargement on the right here? Yes. And uh, actually, if you can point out the apparent blood stains that we're seeing here. And those apparent blood stains have been indicated and marked by the yellow, uh, indicated by the yellow areas highlighted here? Yes. And do we also see some evidence stickers that you've been referring to before? Yes. So what is the object indicated by the red arrow? We'll see another picture of it later, but what is this object pointed out by the red arrow here? That's a shovel. Did that shovel also appear to have some blood stains on it? Yes. The next slide should be enlargements from the photo on the left here. 
Uh, what's pointed out by the red arrows? Here. A pair of blood stains. So it was not only on the bottom of the refrigerator, but also appeared to be on the floor and under the rug? Yes. Did there appear to be apparent blood on the orange part of the rug or just underneath? It appeared to be underneath, if I remember, yeah. Which would suggest to you what? Someone covered it. it was, the blood was there first, the rug went on top of it. And we see some apparent blood on the bottom side of the refrigerator. Was there also apparent blood on the bottom front of the refrigerator as well? Yes. Is that depicted in this next photo from State's Exhibit 32P? Yes. And uh, apparent blood on the front of the refrigerator, if you could point that out for us, please. Sure. And that's again another evidence sticker that was placed by you and other investigators? And with respect to the apparent blood on the front of the refrigerator, uh, one or more than one apparent stains? More than one. And is this next slide that same photo with an enlargement of the apparent multiple blood stains here on the right? Yes. In addition to photographing these apparent blood stains, did you do anything with respect to them for possible scientific testing? Hello. We collected them on a swab and brought them to the lab. The unique evidence numbers assigned to some of the swabbings of apparent blood stains that were taken from this area, did they include TLE 30, which we see on the upper left, TLE 31, which we see on the bottom, and TLE 64, which we see on the right? Yes. And are those same unique evidence numbers also seen in State's Exhibit 60 on the column on the left, TLE 30, TLE 64, and TLE 31? Yes. Uh, you just discussed that by the refrigerator there was a sliding door that led to uh, the enclosed porch. Showing you State's Exhibit 32Q, does this show some of the main photographs that were taken of the enclosed porch area of that house? Yes. And going through the photos of this area of the house, we're going to start with the three photographs along the top to orientate ourselves, Kim. And that enclosed porch is the area between the outside porch on the left and the outside porch on the right? Yes. And again, it's only been a little time since the jurors last saw this, but what area of the house is this uh, outside porch in yellow here? I call it the driveway side of the house. And what about the highlighted portion in red here? What outside portion of the porch is this? That's where the hot tub was. And again, where ultimately were the victim's bodies found? Right underneath the hot tub. So let's turn to photos depicting the inside of the enclosed porch area between the two outside porch areas. First, we have a sliding door here in the middle. Uh, where does the sliding door lead to? Towards the kitchen. And is that the same sliding door we saw before and the refrigerator's here and the uh, rug on the floor is here? Yes. The shovel that was referred to before, do we see that shovel here? Yes. And where's the shovel? How's that indicated? Oh, the red, um, the red arrow. The next photo is going to be a closer view of this slider door arrow by the kitchen. Now, there have been evidence tags placed as uh, part of the crime scene processing in this part of the uh, enclosed porch. Yes. Uh, TLE 33, is that the shovel that was been referred to before? Yes. There are several additional evidence stickers here. We got TLE 27, 28, 29, and TLE 34. They're going to be enlarged in the next slide. What potential evidence do these stickers document? TLE 27, 28, 29, and 34. So 27, 29, and 34 are swabs of potential blood, and 28 is a backup nearing. Uh, can we actually see that earring backing in this photograph? You, kind of, not really. It's very difficult. Uh, returning to the shovel, TLE 33, was any apparent blood found on that item? Yes. And is that apparent blood seen in these two photographs of the shovel? Uh, can you repeat that? Sure. Can we see some of that apparent blood staining on the shovel in these two photographs? Yes. And where? In addition to photographing these apparent blood stains on the shovel, was the shovel taken for possible scientific analysis? Yes. Mm -hmm. The unique evidence number assigned to the shovel, TLE 33, is that same unique evidence number also seen in State's Exhibit 60, highlighted in yellow on the column to the left? Yes. Uh, the plastic bins that we see here, the photo on the left highlighted in yellow, the photo, photo on the right highlighted in yellow, are they the same bins taken from different angles? Yes. The rugs that were sh that's shown on the floor here, we have multiple rugs on the floor, was additional apparent blood found underneath those rugs? Yes. Did the rugs appear to be placed over the apparent blood stains after the blood had been deposited on the floor? Yes. And, and why do you say that? Because if the blood was there first, it would have been on the top of the rug and not underneath the rug. And there was, we didn't observe anything on top. So focusing now on the photograph here on the right. Uh, in the back of the photo, there is a what appears to be a sliding door. It's highlighted in yellow. Where does this sliding door lead to? Uh, deck the hot tub. Among the other items that were found inside this enclosed porch was one of those other items, a container of ice melter. Yes. And where is that container of ice melter seen in this particular photo? If you look at the red arrow, that's right there. You also see uh, two wooden tables indicated by the blue arrows on the left. Yes. So these two tables are going to be used for a frame of reference for the next photograph. Are these the same two tables that we saw in the previous photograph? Yes. Uh, where is the hot tub on the upside deck? Right here. And what is the purple, the pink object on the deck by the hot tub that's circled in yellow? It's a rug. And we're going to see more photographs of that shortly. And what is the red arrow in the middle of this photograph pointing to? The ice melt. Focusing on the interior of this white sliding door here, was more apparent blood staining found on the interior of the sliding door? Yes. And uh, was it appear to be more than one stain or one stain? More than one. And the next slide is going to focus on the inside of this interior slider door. And where is some of the apparent blood stains found on the interior of that slider door? Yeah. 
And what you're pointing to here, that's the side of the door? Yes. So apparent blood stains are both in the bottom as well as the side? Yes. Turning to another photo from States Exhibit 32Q, is the red arrow pointing to that same container of ice melter that was seen in previous photos? Yes. And going to the last of the photos from States Exhibit 32Q, uh, is this another photo of that same ice melter that we've seen before? Yes. Uh, the enlargement on the right of the highlighted yellow area here, uh, do we see some additional apparent blood staining on the floor? Yes. And is it more than one or one apparent blood stain? Uh, with respect to this container of ice melter, most of the jurors can probably figure it out, but what are we talking about when we say ice melter? It's a, a white material that helps melt ice. The container of ice melter that was found and documented on the enclosed porch, or in the enclosed porch that we're looking at here, did it appear to be opened or unopened? Opened. And was the container full, or did it look like an en contents of it had been emptied? It's almost empty, completely empty. Uh, was there still some contents in the container? Yes. And if you can describe generally what the contents looked like inside the container? They're like little white balls or uh, broken material. The next uh, slide, the top two photos, are these photos that we just saw of the ice melter inside that enclosed porch area? Yes. And the bottom photos are taken from State's Exhibit 38, which the jurors saw last week. And I'll ask the jurors to take a few moments to compare the photos. <clears throat> In addition to photographing, uh, photographing that open container of ice, mel ice melter that was found inside the enclosed porch, was that container of ice melter also taken for possible scientific testing? Yes. And what unique evidence number was assigned to the ice melter found inside the enclosed porch? Give me one second. And if it's helpful, maybe Discovery 503. Thank you. It's TLE 69. Going back to one of the charts, States Exhibit 62, do you see that same unique evidence number, TLE 69, on the left-hand column highlighted in yellow? <coughs> yes. Now, you talked about how there was a sliding door by that open container of ice melter that led outside to the deck with the hot tub. Um, is that that area in red in these photographs? Yes. Was apparent blood also observed in this outside deck area by the hot tub? Yes. Is that outside area uh, and photographs of that outside area, uh, some of the photographs from uh, the crime scene processing, are, these, uh, are those, some of those photographs seen in States Exhibit 32R, which we're looking at at the screen? Yes. So going first to the photo on the upper left, which was seen before. You said that the hot tub for frame of reference for other photos is this object that I'm indicating with a laser pointer? Yes. And again, what's the object that's highlighted here in yellow? That's uh, the purple rug. Do we see that same purple rug in this photograph? Yes. And uh, the hot tub to the right, was it covered? Yes. And did it appear that the cover recently had been opened? It wasn't clamped down, but no, it did not look like it had been opened. And why do you say that? There was snow on top of it. Looking at the next slide, States Exhibit 94, what does it depict? It's snow on top of the cover. Although the hot tub did not appear to have been recently opened, did you, in fact, open the cover and look inside the hot tub? So I didn't open the whole thing. I was searching for blood, but I did open to see if there was any blood right in the corner. Was this photograph taken before or after you opened the hot tub and looked inside it? Before. And what happened to the snow and the ice on top of the cover that we see here when you opened up the hot tub? I don't remember because it was heavy. I just remember it was awkward. Did you see anything of potential evidentiary value inside the hot tub when you looked inside of it? No. Uh, for example, did you see any apparent blood inside the hot tub? No. Was apparent blood seen by the purple rug that was by the hot tub? Yes. Uh, there's some white material that's pointed out by the red arrow. Was that something that was found by the purple rug and apparent blood stains? Uh, or was that placed by investigators afterwards? No, it was there. Was there additional white material similar to that we're looking at now underneath this rug? Yes. Uh, the steps by the rug, did it also appear to have apparent blood stains? Yes. And the next slide is going to be an enlargement of those steps. And where was apparent blood stains found on these steps? Uh, returning to the purple rug, is this a picture of the same rug taken towards the enclosed porch? Yes. Uh, focusing on the sliding door into the enclosed porch at the top of this photo here, we talked about there appear to be multiple blood stains that were seen and documented on the inside of the slider door. What about the outside of the slider door? Were there also additional what appeared to be multiple blood stains? Yes. And the next photo is going to be an enlargement of that portion of the exterior of the sliding door. And where were some of the apparent blood staining on the outside of that slider door? And the apparent blood staining on the outside, did it appear to be focused primarily towards the bottom of the door? Yes. Uh, what does this photograph taken from State's Exhibit 32R depict? This, we collected the rug, and this is underneath what we observed under the rug. Is this uh, kind of what you talked about at the very beginning of your testimony, how it was a step-by-step -step process, and you and other investigators may move items and take photos documenting the movement of items? Yes. So this was what was seen underneath that purple rug? Yes. Turning to the last photos from, uh, of the photos from State's Exhibit 32R. Is this a close-up of the white material that was found near and underneath that purple rug on the deck? Yes. The, the white material that was seen by and underneath that rug, was that consistent in appearance with the contents of the open ice melter container that were found in the enclosed porch? Right, the objection? 
overruled. Go ahead. Based on your own observations, uh, was the white material that we're seeing here, was it consistent in appearance with the contents of the open ice melter container that was in the enclosed porch? Yes. The rug, was that collected as potential evidence? Yes. And what unique evidence number was assigned to the rug? Tally 46. In addition to photographing the rug that was found on the deck, was that rug also taken for possible scientific testing? Yes. Returning to State's Exhibit 60, is that same unique evidence number, TLE 46, uh, seen highlighted in yellow on the left-hand column? Yes. Is State's Exhibit 42 a series of photograph, uh, photographs of that rug and some of the other items that we've discussed that you processed at the house as part of crime scene investigation? Yes. And does this also have your unique evidence numbers that were assigned to these various items? Yes. And does this next slide show other items that we have discussed with their corresponding unique evidence number and where they were found? Yes. And are all eight of these unique evidence numbers listed on State's Exhibit 62, highlighted in yellow on the column on the left? Yes. Uh, Judge, when would you like to take a break? Right now. Uh, so folks, it's 2.30. We're going to break for 15 minutes. We'll come back at quarter of three. Skipping. Skipping. I'm multitasking. I'm going through J Judge Bev's um ruling on dismissing Karen Reed case too so I'm multitasking and attorney Hinkley when you're ready thank you judge at various times during your previous testimony you talked about uh, where the victims had been found I now um, want to go to that area where the real quick while I'm thinking about it um we were not we will not do the members only on Sunday because um as somebody reminded me um Sunday is Easter. So we will not do it this week, but we'll pick it back up next week. Victims' bodies were found. Up on the screen is State's Exhibit 32S. Uh, does this contain some of the many photographs taken of that area that was uh, that were taken as part of the crime scene processing by you and other investigators? Yes. So let's start with the photo on the upper left, which the jurors have seen before. About where were the bodies found in this photo? It's going to hit her head. Sorry. Frame you. Nope. Uh, for frame of reference, uh, a large black barrel has been highlighted in yellow. I'm using that as a point of reference for the next photo. Can you see that same barrel here? Yes. Uh, where do the stairs above the barrel lead to? The deck with the hot tub. And this area back here is the back of the house? Yes. This next slide, is it still the back of the house closer to those exterior stairs leading to the hot tub? Yes. Does this photo show some of the debris pile under which the victims were found? Yes. And where is that debris pile that we'll be looking at in other photos? Right over here. Uh, what is the building in the background that I'm pointing to with the laser points? That is the detached garage. And what about these blue objects that I'm pointing to outside the detached garage? Tarps. Turning to another photo, the jurors have seen this many times before. Uh, about where in the photo were the victim's bodies located? Right over here. For a frame of reference, we have what appears to be a ladder that's against the side of the building highlighted in yellow, yes? Yes. Is that same ladder here? Yes. Does this photo show some of the debris pile under which the victims were found? Yes. And where is that? Right here. And I believe the next photo is going to be looking around the corner here. And the ladder's here, there's the corner. What again is the object that's depicted in the yellow, I'm sorry, the orange circle in the corner here? It's a surveillance camera. And the next slide is going to be a closer view of this same area. And is this again the surveillance camera? Yes. Does this show a more complete view of the debris pile under which the victims were? Yes. Was this photograph taken before items were moved and the victims' bodies ultimately were discovered? Yes. And is this another photo of that same debris pile from another angle? Yes. The open door that's indicated by the red arrow, where again does this door lead to? That's the tool room and it leads to that first side um, door to the basement. On the bottom of the photo, some items have been pointed out by blue arrows. So we have a, appears to be a green board and we have something laying against the house. Okay, hold on. Time out. I told y'all I'm kind of multitasking. Um, and I'm on page 22 of 24 going through Bev's ruling. And she talks about the 2.27 a.m. search. And this is what she says. Um, in her supplemental memorandum the defendant argues that the commonwealth intentionally and recklessly deceived the grand jury by presenting an incomplete extraction of jim mccabe's cell phone as an exhibit before the grand jury so um they're saying that uh so it, uh, let me skip forward um, according to the defendant this grand jury exhibit purposely left off a google search that jim mccabe made at 227 before o'keefe's body was discovered stating how long to die in cold the defendant has not shown that the commonwealth improperly withheld this evidence the grand jury exhibit referred to by the defendant is a celebrite 
cell phone extraction report from Jen McCabe's cell phone containing the call log, contacts, instant messages, and tags in her cell phone. A more recent Celebrite report obtained during the federal investigation provides the web history of the phone, including the aforementioned Google search at 2.27 a.m. and and a search for how long to die in cold with it spelled wrong at 6.23 and 6.24 a.m. Grand jury exhibit referred to a more recent Celebrite. This is the part that's, this is the part, this is the part. A more recent Celebrite report obtained during the federal investigation provides the web history of the phone, including the aforementioned search at 2.27 a.m. and... The search is at 623 and 624. So she's saying that they didn't withhold it. It was not on the original report, which we've already been through that. But, um, But she's saying that the new report obtained during the federal investigation provides the web history of the search at 227 and 623 and 624. Yeah, it was, it, there's three separate searches that show up. The one is at 227 a.m. And that one was showing as deleted and then there was one at 623 that's spelled where cold is spelled c-i-k-d and then there's one a minute later where it's spelled the same as it was at 227 and it's generated as um i can't remember the exact words i've got the pictures of it um up but it's from uh, recent searches or however that whatever that term is from recent search history or whatever um, and it's from recent search history because it was done at 227 so so Bev says that the federal investigation Celebrite report shows the web history including the Google search at 2.27 a.m. and a search for how long to die in the cold at 6.23 and 6.24. So... Are we finally, like admitting that it happened because I I sure hope so because all those people who came after me on Twitter load of mercy load of mercy right. does the end of the green board here closest to the stairs does it appear to be on concrete or on rocks it looks like rocks and using that as a frame of reference for the next photo on the screen is states exhibit 37 do those same items the board and what's leaning up against the house appear to be pointed out by the blue arrows in this bottom photograph yes Going back to the crime scene photo, the pile that's highlighted in yellow, and the next slide is going to be a closer look of that location. And that's this is the last of the photos from State's Exhibit 32S. Is under this debris pile where the bodies of Christine Sullivan and Jenna Pellegrini ultimately were found? Yes. And how generally did you and other investigators go about removing items from this pile and uncovering the bodies? Just as described before, by in layers and photographing those layers. And so were many photographs taken at various stages of this unlayering and removal process? Yes. So the photo seen here is from State's Exhibit 32T. Are they some of the many photos taken as part of that process of removing items from the pile and uncovering the victims' bodies? Yes. Generally describe how the victims were in this pile. They were wrapped underneath it, uh, blankets and tarps. And let's start with the photo on the upper left. 
What were some of the items in or near that debris pile along with the victim's bodies? There's tra uh, chairs, buckets, rugs. You stated that among the items that were near the victim's bodies were buckets. Do we see some buckets that are highlight? I'm sorry, that are circled in yellow here? Yes. And the next slide is going to be an enlargement of this area right here. What generally are these circled items right here? The bucket? Yeah, buckets. Yes. And what was found inside these buckets by the bodies? Um, there was hat and there was uh, um, also some apparent blood-stained objects. And are these same items circled in this and other photographs from State's Exhibit 32T? Yes. In this photo, there appears to be no wooden chairs on top of the debris pile. And is that because it's part of that process of removing items and documenting as you do so? Yes. Let's move on to another photo from State's Exhibit 32T. Again, do we see those same buckets circled in yellow off to the right here? Yes. What are uh, some of the items in this debris pile that's shown here? So we have blankets. This looks like a tarp. This is the tarp. This looks like a, if you were painting a cloth, and another tarp, and an air mattress, buckets. And where were the victim's body found, bodies found in this debris pile? So right here and then right here. And turning to another photo from State's Exhibit 32, are the bodies still in the debris pile in this photo? Yes. Uh, two areas have been highlighted and enlarged to the right. First is the item highlighted in red, enlarged to the right. What is that? Frayed tarp. And where was that tarp relative to where Jenna Pellegrini's body was found? Underneath her. And what was the general condition of this tarp that was found underneath Jenna Pellegrini's body, as seen in this enlargement here? Um, frayed. You talked about how blue fibers were found on the floor of various places inside the house, the bedroom where the bloodstained mattress was, also the tool room. We also saw fibers outside the detached garage. Were those found fibers consistent with the frayed fibers that you saw on the blue tarp underneath Jenna Pellegrini's body? Yes. What is the other enlarged item that's highlighted in yellow here? The blanket. And what about the red color here? That is a apparent blood stain. And whose body was found within that bedding with apparent blood staining on it? Jenna. Turning to the last of the photos from State's Exhibit 32T, is part of Ms. Pellegrini's body shown in this photo? Yes. And uh, what do we see here? Right here, navy blue socks, her feet. What is the white and pink and red pattern item that's by her socked feet? A blanket. And again, what's enlarged over to the right, highlighted in yellow? Those are her feet. And to the left of Ms. Pellegrini's feet, we see some more of that frayed blue tarp that we've seen pieces of, or we've seen pieces of frayed tarp before. Yes. You noted earlier that a white baseball hat was among the items found near the bodies of Christine Sullivan and Jenna Pellegrini. Actually, did you say it was white or just a baseball hat? I think I just said baseball. My apologies. A baseball hat was found by the bodies of yes. Jenna Pellegrini and Christine Sullivan. And the State's Exhibit 32U contained some of the photos that were taken of that item as well as other items as part of the crime scene processing conducted by you and other investigators. Yes. So let's turn first to the photo on the upper left, which has been shown before. And where again was that baseball hat found? Right in this bucket. Turning to another photograph. Was this photo taken after items had been moved from the pile where the victim's bodies were found? Yes. What is the dark colored item TLE 78? A trash bag. And what is the item circled in yellow TLE 80? Um, one second. So on 000503, it, it's um, I put items with RBS. So taking a closer look at that bucket. And here do we see items with apparent blood staining that was found in that bucket? Yes. Does this photo also show the hat that was found by the debris pile? Yes. And where is the hat here? Right here. And was the hat also in a bucket? Yes. And with respect to the hat and the bucket that it was found in, going to the next photo, does this last photo from State's Exhibit 32U show that hat and bucket? Yes. And do you see any apparent blood staining on the hat? Yes. And where do you see apparent blood staining on the hat? Here. The same photo that we're looking at now, is it also seen on the upper left-hand portion of State's Exhibit 39? Yes. In addition to photographing that baseball hat that was found along with the victim's bodies, was that hat also taken for possible scientific testing? Yes. And what unique evidence number was assigned to the hat? TLE 79. Going back to State's Exhibit 61, do you see that same unique evidence number, TLE 79, along the upper row highlighted in yellow in the far right-hand columns here? Yes. And lastly, going back to State's Exhibit 60, do you see that same unique evidence number, TLE 79, for the hat? Do you see that highlighted in yellow on the column on the left? Yes. One moment. Yes. <clears throat> No further questions. All right, thank you. Cross-examination.
She, noted, she notes at the bottom here, look, I want to show this real quick while they're doing this. Um, the court notes that the time or times of this Google search is a hotly disputed issue, to say the least. <coughs> to say the least. Very interesting. Good afternoon. Hi. Thank you for your patience. Um, so you reviewed this a little bit at the beginning, but um, your role uh, in this investigation was to collect evidence, right? Yes. Um, you didn't decide whether that evidence was ultimately tested? No. Um, and you didn't bit. end up doing any of the testing yourself? That is correct. Or drawing any conclusions from the testing? No. Uh, occasionally, the state showed you some charts, uh, such as this one, and asked you about uh, the TLE numbers that were on the left, correct? Yes. The purpose was to ask you about the TLE numbers and confirm that those were items that you collected? Yes. Now, you had nothing to do with the information that was on the right-hand parts of those charts, correct? Correct. The conclusions? Correct. And as you testified, you collected many items of evidence in this case? Yes. In total, over 500? Yes. And many of them were uh, collected for the purpose of possible DNA testing or fingerprint testing? Any kind of testing. Okay. Uh, including those? Including those, yes. Okay. And many more items than the ones depicted on screen were collected for the possibility of those? Possibly. I'm asking you, when you collected them, what was in your mind when you were collecting them? Was it for fingerprint analysis or DNA analysis? I think when you go into a crime scene, it's, you're supposed to read the search warrant, review it, and based on the search warrant, collect items that, are, that you're allowed to. So that's really the reference. Time. Yes, is it possible that DNA would uh, be there, and could there be fingerprints? Absolutely. Okay, so are you saying that when you look at items, you don't consider that maybe fingerprints are on them? It depends on the surface that they're on, okay, or, so whatever we're collecting. Okay, so you do look at the surface and say, this is a possibility that DNA or fingerprints might be on this. Yes. And certainly more than seven or eight items that you looked at through the investigation, you had that thought. Yes. Um, you were on the, uh, the property of Meterboro from January 29th through February 3rd, 2017, right? Well, I wasn't there one of the days because I was at autopsy. Okay. Uh, so other than that day, um, you, were, you were there between those days? Yes. Um, and when you were there, the residence was secured? I believe so, yes. Um, so in, in this investigation and in typical investigations like this, no one other than law enforcement could access the house? To my knowledge, yes. So to your knowledge, only people involved with the murder investigation like yourself touched or handled the evidence? I don't understand your question. As far as you know, nobody outside of law enforcement involving the investigation touched or handled the evidence once the investigation started. So the evidence that I collected has a chain of custody on it, so that, that would be my understanding. Okay. Is it typical in these investigations to allow people who are not law enforcement to come on the scene and touch the evidence? No, that's not common. Right. Okay. I'm showing what's marked as defense exhibit E. Uh, this is the Depiction from Meterboro Road up the driveway to the house, right? Yes. You testified a little bit about this. That's the detached garage there to the left. Yes. And front stairs to the house are depicted there, pretty much right in the center of the photo. Yes. Uh, there are no other stairs in the front of the house. That is the, the one staircase in the front, right? That's what I remember. Okay. Uh, and around there to the right is the, uh, the detached garage. Um, is the pedestrian door to the detached garage? Yes. Okay. Um, and this is the, or excuse me, defense exhibit L. Um, and as you sit on direct, um, you enter the detached garage. Yes. And you and other technicians uh, took pictures both inside and outside of the garage? Yes. Uh, and the windows inside the garage uh, were all painted green? Yes. Here's an example of the green painted window. This is on the garage door, not the pedestrian door, but the door where our cars would go through, correct? Yes. And this next picture was uh, shown in the state's presentation. This is the back end of the detached garage? Yes. And you can see on the bottom windows there that those are also painted green? I believe so. I can't, I can't tell them. I assume, does that make it clear for you that they appear to be painted green as well? They look green, yes. Parts of them. Uh, now there's a second level, excuse me, this is uh, defense exhibit H4, which is evident in the full exhibit by agreement. Um, there was also a second story to the garage, or an upper level? Yes. Um, and this area was used for storage? It looks that way, yes. Yeah. There's quite a few items in there? Yes. 
I think I would describe those as storage bins. Yes. Now, there's also quite a few trash bags that were um, in throughout the garage. This is H8. This is an example of a trash bag that was found in the garage. Yes. This is defense exhibit H6. This is another example of a trash bag found in the garage. Yes. And I think the, the one over to the left is the one that we viewed in the exhibit before. And you, in fact, uh, removed trash from the bags and photographed them, right? I did not. Okay. Uh, did you view the trash from the bags once they were removed? So, can I elaborate on that? Because I don't remember doing that particular piece right there. Um, are you aware that this happened during the investigation that these bags were empty? Yes. Can you see right there in the middle of the Clorox bottle? Yes. <clears throat> now that, you testified on, on direct that not every piece of evidence or every item on a scene is collected, right? Correct. And this would be an example of one of the items in the other that was collected? I didn't collect that. Now, the jurors view and you discussed State's Exhibit 33, which I'm now showing. This is the state's map of various surveillance cameras and their directions, right? Yes. The state's Exhibit 32B is a compilation of various cameras uh, associated with the numbers uh, on the map right there in the middle, right? Yes. Do you remember testifying to that on direct? Yes. Now, on direct, you agree with the state that this depicted all six cameras that were found in the residence. Yes. But there were actually quite a few other cameras that were tagged and were not referenced on direct. I'd have to look at my notes. So I'll show you first that's exhibit L2. Your notes reference a TLE 179? Yes. So this is a camera that is above the door that is entering into the tool area as if you were standing in the driveway looking at the tool area, correct? I believe so. So this would make this camera facing the driveway? Yes. You have to see exhibit two, which is facing down the driveway, but there's no camera location for one facing directly into the driveway. Um, I just, uh, who sent this? Kelly, who sent this? Um, I just got this um, standoff thing that you sent me. I'm pulling it up. I'm showing you what's marked as defense exhibit H. This is, you saw a picture of this on direct, in the back end of the house, where I'm pointing to that's where the bodies were found, correct? Yes. Now, where I'm pointing up here in the top left of the deck, that's a surveillance camera, correct? I don't, I don't know if it's a lighter or a surveillance camera. I'd have to look. Defense exhibit A, which is from a different angle. Yep. Is that clear to you, the yeah, camera? Yes. And here's one more that's up close. Can you read that number there on the tag? I know it's dark out and oh. there's a little bit of glare. It's 181. Now again, from this angle, this is the back end of the house. That camera is over the box, right? It looks like it's pointing towards the driveway. That's right. It's pointing towards the driveway. It's connected to the porch that is directly over the driveway. <coughs> on the state's exhibit 33, there's no corresponding camera in that location, correct? Correct. Next, I'm going to show you defense exhibit I. You saw a similar, if not an identical, picture in the state's presentation. Point to the far left, you'll see that there's a camera there. Yep. And you testified to that camera on direct, and that camera is depicted on the state's exhibit. But I want to point up to the chimney area. Now, first, to the right of the chimney, that's a door that enters into the kitchen, right? Yes. And right above that is another camera, correct? Yes. Did you tag this? 182? Yes. Now again, two is the one that we just pointed out, the one you discussed on direct. The one where I'm pointing here, where the chimney is, there's no corresponding camera number to 182, correct? Correct. What I'm 
sorry, not alpha reference. That's exhibit 02. What I'm going to show you next is state's exhibit 32M. State reviewed this with you, and uh, you discussed various uh, items in, the, uh, in this exhibit. Um, one of which included these areas that are circled green for yeah, surveillance camera that was on that desk, right? Yes. Now, that surveillance camera uh, is referenced in the state's exhibit, right? Yes. That was one that you talked about on the state. Showed you this? Yes, seven. Number seven? Yes. Now, you didn't actually tag and collect that camera, did you? I don't know. I'd have to look. You want to take a look? Yeah. Um, it says that the suspect <coughs> is believed to be inside the home. I wasn't the only evidence tech, so I'm not sure. Alone. I think they heard gunshots inside the home, but they don't think that it was aimed at them. Barricaded in. I collected a camera in the basement. It's just not described. I'm not sure if I collected that one or not. I would have to have to see something with an evidence number on it. Okay. So. You collected CLE 224 in the basement, right? Yeah, I think that's what the number was. So, uh, there was a, in the basement, TLE-224. Okay. You recall TLE-224 being this camera above the television area? I have no idea. I would need to see the placard the photograph. We'll try to come back to that. All of this, which is close up of states 32M, there's a handheld camcorder here at the bottom. Yes. And you testified on direct that you determined on the scene that that was not connected to the surveillance system? It, the team of us did, yes. Okay. Uh, so you didn't collect that? I don't know. I'd have to see the evidence numbers. Well, if there's no evidence number attached to it. Well, this, we took 5,000 photos, so I'm not sure if that's the camera. I just have it described as 224 is a camera. I don't know which one. Okay. I'm moving on from 224, and you may return to that. I'm asking about this camera down here at the bottom. Can you see that? I know that your view was blocked. Yeah, no, I can see it. And to the right of that was the camera you testified to that was obscured by the binoculars. Yes. Right. So this is not the one obscured by binoculars in that area. That's correct. So, the fancy to the wide, which I thought you earlier, which shows both of those. Camcorder there, and then the camera obscured by the Now, you weren't, as an evidence tech, responsible for examining the functionality of the surveillance system, right? That is correct. But yet, you and your team had decided on the scene that that camera was not worth collecting? We didn't have a direct conversation. This was a long time ago. I'm not even sure if that was collected or not, because I okay. wasn't there. I wasn't the only evidence tech. I wasn't there for one full day. Okay. So I am just asking about you then, collecting that. I don't remember. Okay. Did you review your reports before testifying? Yes. <coughs> and you saw nothing in those reports about a handheld camcorder like that? I just have a described camera. Now I'm going to go to the entryway to the laundry room area, or what's been called the utility room, and also the laundry room, uh, laundry room. This is the door that enters into uh, that area, correct? Yes. That's the area from the driveway? Yes. This door is adjacent to the driveway? Okay. Um, I'm showing what's marked as uh, de Defense Exhibit N. Now you'll see that there are, there's a deadbolt at the top, locking mechanism, right? Yes. And then down here at the bottom is a biometric handle or locking mechanism? Yes. You ended up tagging and collecting both of these? I remember the biometric. I'm pretty sure we took the other one as well. OK. Uh, it appears that they are separate or independent mechanisms. It appears that way, yes. Showing um, defense exhibit O, which is a close-up of the biometric block. Defense exhibit P, which is a close-up of the now, what color is this door? Green. Does that color match the color of these spray-painted windows? It looks like it does, yes. I'm going to turn next to what we're showing to you is 
States Exhibit 32J. Throughout her direct examination, the state repeatedly referenced the two bags in the bottom left picture, the two bags in this photo. One being TLB 55. That's your tag, correct? Yes. And you testified that you were aware of GMH 15, which is the black bag behind it. Yes. There's also a third clear bag under TLB 55. Correct? There's, yep, there's something, yep. That is a clear trash bag? Yes. Now, that wasn't collected or tagged as evidence. I don't remember. You repeatedly talked about two bags in this picture, this and there's a third bag. Oh, well, right? Yes. So if you talked about two bags, and there's a third, then that third must mean it wasn't collected. I wasn't there every single day. It could have been photographed. It doesn't mean it, the items in it could have been absolutely put on a bunch of paper and had the same process. I don't remember. OK, but you didn't do that. I don't recall. Again, you reviewed your reports before testifying. Yes. And your report talked about TLE 55 taking one bag, right? Yes. That bag was cleared out and photographed by you, right? Well, a team of us, yes. Okay. And there was not a second bag that you cleared out and examined and your team photographed. I didn't collect any evidence from any, any other bag from right. this pile, I, that, from my memory. Or from reviewing all of your reports before testifying today. Yes. The reason I ask is because some people were testifying today haven't thought about this since 2017 or it's not fresh on their mind. But you have refreshed your recollection. You have reviewed evidence in your reports before testifying today. Yes. Now, are you also aware Hi. that these bags were contaminated by flood water from a burst pipe? I was aware of that. Did you note that in any of your reports? No. Did you think that maybe that would have an effect on the quality of the evidence? I think it, it could. And yet you didn't report that? I wasn't there that day. You didn't testify to that either? You didn't testify to that? That I wasn't there that day? You didn't testify to knowing that these were contaminated by flood water from the first pipe? On direct? That's right. No one asked me that question. And so through this utility room, enters into the finished basement area, which is the, um, someone referred, referred to it as the den. You saw pictures of it earlier with the pool table and couch and other items, right? The couch in the office, the pool table, yes. And I think right here is that's the big roll of butcher paper that you utilized when you're separating out items and photographing them. Yes. And right here in the middle, this is this is X. Uh, right here in the middle, that is a laptop. Yes. Or TLE 73. Correct? Yes. Sorry. And now it's what is it is? Yes. They testified on direct about the area where the uh, surveillance DVR hard drive system was located. And this is where the system was located before it was removed and put on that butcher paper, right? Yes. This is sort of the surveillance system itself. Right? I believe so, yes. Look at her. This is defense exhibit C1, moving on to defense exhibit D1. These are some of the items laid out on that butcher paper from that cabinet? Yes. I'm showing defense to the B1. Uh, this appears to be a travel bag, a black travel bag carry on suitcase. Yes. Right. Defense to the E1. This is tagged as TLE 71. It looks like the whole rest of this yes. day is just. I'm sorry, just for the record. I just want to make sure I didn't know if you were asking me a question or just stating a fact. I'm just confirming because the written record needs to show what we're talking about, but someone might not be looking at the slideshow if it says that. It looks uh, like this is E1. the whole rest of this day, because remember, we're one day behind because I didn't get to stream yesterday. It looks like the whole rest of this day is the him going back over and just asking her, making her go through all the pictures again. Do you want to let, do you want to watch the rest of this or do you want to go ahead and skip to where they started today? He's kind of getting a little bit tedious with it. Let's do a poll. And you took items out of this bag uh, to photograph them? I believe this item was taken apart by uh, Trooper Amachucci okay. on the day that I was not there. But I would have to review my notes, my reports, to okay. co confirm that. We'll move to the next slide and direct you to where you should look. Testify on direct about $10,000 worth of cash? Yes. And that's TLE 71J? Yes. <clears throat> and this is this was in that black bag, right? And I saw that in photographs, yes. Okay. So when it says TLE 71J, the letter after the number is an indication of its parent exhibit, right? Yes. So 71 is a suitcase, so 71J must mean it came from that suitcase. Yes. 
So I'll give the record that's defense exhibit G1. Oh, defense exhibit H1. <coughs> this is that's the money that we money talked laid out. about. This is consistent yeah. with how money is laid out in investigations of this type? Yes. So I want to move into the master bedroom. Okay. The master bedroom was Everybody's pretty much saying go to today. So um, let's go to today. Go to, to the jury will be the truth and the whole truth under the penalties of perjury. I do. Please be seated. All right. <clears throat> and if you can please introduce yourself to the jurors. Yes, my name is Stephen Ostrowski. And where do you work? I work for the New Hampshire Department of Safety State Police Forensic Laboratory in Concord. And for about how long have you worked for the Slow state lab? Down. About. Almost 25 years now. And what is your present assignment at the lab? I am currently a criminalist three, uh, supervising the pattern evidence unit. And what do you mean by criminalist three? Uh, there's different levels of criminalist. Uh, a criminalist one is uh, a forensic scientist that does casework primarily. A criminalist two has additional duties of, of training and reviewing other people's work. And then on top of that, a criminalist three has supervisory duties, which uh, what I do. And again, what unit do you work for in the state lab? It's the pattern evidence unit, which, which um, relates to fingerprints and footwear and tire impressions. And are those the types of analyses that you conduct at the state lab? Uh, yes, it is. Can you go over your training and experience, focus on the uh, analysis of latent impressions? Yeah, so after I uh, earned my master's degree in forensic science from the University of New Haven down in Connecticut, uh, I began working at the lab in 1999. Uh, and from that point, I had a, a one-year extensive in-house training program under three senior fingerprint examiners with 30-plus years experience. Uh, so after I got done training, um, I tested out and was authorized to do independent casework. Uh, and part of, the, part of the training included uh, reading numerous uh, professional journal articles and textbooks on the areas of fingerprints, uh, attaining, I attended three uh, FBI uh, courses on, on fingerprints. I attended uh, specialized courses on, on fingerprints, palm prints, and, and difficult complex impressions out, out of state. Uh, I attended numerous conferences and meetings, uh, even um, presenting eventually at some of those meetings and, and writing articles that are published in journals. Uh, and to date, I've worked with about 2,000 different fingerprint cases. All right, do we want to skip the resume? Cases. And the print is a type of here and leave uh, a, a latent fingerprint, whether through powders. Conducting latent impression examinations? About? Uh, about 24 years. And you are certified as a latent we, we print trust uh, organizations in the entire through training. Sit for, uh, and from that point, from KVU analyses conducted by other examiners for law. Uh, uh, we have we have residues on our hands, and our hands are made up of a special kind of skin called friction-rich skin. Uh, so the fingerprint, there's uh, residues and sweat and uh, foreign contaminants on our hands, and when we touch things, we leave those impressions or replications of the skin behind. Uh, so those types of prints could be developed uh, and used in forensic cases. Let's talk about some misconceptions that may people may have from watching TV or the movies regarding overall regarding latent impressions such as fingerprints. If I See, this stuff is like, I like this stuff. It's like, okay, let's talk about the common misconceptions of this. But I'm sure he's lovely and he has a great background, but this is the part of speech trial. Like, we can kind of like skip through his resume stuff and just get to the, you know, the stuff that, the meat and potatoes. Touch an item such as I'm touching this podium right now. Does that mean that my fingerprints are necessarily going to be left behind on this item? Not necessarily. There's lots of times where we touch items and don't leave uh, a good fingerprint behind. We might leave fragments of a fingerprint or just residues, uh, but it's not necessarily guaranteed that when you touch an item, you leave a good fingerprint behind. Uh, are you familiar with the term chance impression? Yes. And, and what does that mean? Uh, it's another name for latent impression. So latent impression is, uh, like I said, a, a impression that we leave behind, but uh, they're also known as by different names and chance impression or, or question or crime scene print or other names for it as well. Going back to my example, I'm touching the podium. Uh, will a latent impression, such a fingerprint, left behind uh, on that object, will it always remain on the item? Uh, no. Uh, it, it, fingerprints or latent prints in general are very delicate, so they need to um, uh, be handled properly and be in a proper environment, and, and things could affect them. It could be wiped off. They could, they could uh, dehydrate and kind of disappear or, or degrade over time. So it doesn't guarantee, just because I touch something doesn't mean my fingerprint's going to remain on it for a long time. Uh, because of the many various factors that impact first whether a, a, an impression will be left behind and how long it stays, is it fair to say that uh, many, different role, many different factors play a role in this? Yes, yes, lots of factors of, of leaving prints behind and lots of factors of the print actually staying on an object and factors of, of developing it in the lab or in a crime scene type situation go into you, obtaining and using uh, usable fingerprints in a, in a case. 
Can recovered latent impressions be used for identification purposes? Yes. Uh, we will talk about this more a little bit. Uh, but even for a particular latent impression, say a fingerprint, and it's found on an object, does that mean that the impression is actually suitable for comparison and potential identification purposes? Uh, not necessarily. There's, there's a wide range of, of quality uh, and quantity of fingerprints that are, that are left behind. So uh, oftentimes there are just fragments of a fingerprint, or sometimes there's many overlays of things that are commonly touched. Think of a doorknob to uh, uh, an office building. Many people may, may touch that doorknob, but, but they may be ruining the fingerprint. All those overlays may make it unusable, any kind of developed prints on there. So there's lots of factors that go into that. I'm going to be talking more about your analysis of uh, latent impressions later on. I want to tur uh, turn to some of the specific work that you performed in this case. Did you attend the autopsies of Jenna Pellegrini and Christine Sullivan on January 31st of 2017? Yes, I did. And for what purpose did you attend their autopsies? Uh, I had two purposes that day. So uh, the first purpose was to examine the bodies and the condition of the bodies and any kind of associated uh, materials that were with the bodies to determine if any uh, question impressions left in, in blood might be present and to document those impressions. Uh, and the second objective was to um, record the known finger and palm prints of, of those two individuals. With respect to looking for impressions that may have been left behind on blood, are those latent prints or are those called something different? Uh, they're called, so uh, something that's left in some material like blood that you could actually see pretty decently, that's called a patent print. Uh, if it was very difficult to see or almost invisible, that would be a latent print, but essentially they're close to the same thing. Did you find any impressions suitable for comparison purposes, either on the victim's bodies or their clothing or any of the materials that their bodies were wrapped in? I did not. You said that the second purpose of you attending the autopsies was to actually obtain fingerprint exemplars from both Ms. Sullivan and Ms. Pellegrini? That's correct. And for what purpose? Uh, that was to uh, record their prints for purposes of comparing it to any other latent prints that were developed in this case. Also, as part of the work that you conducted in this case, did you process the house located at 979 Meterborough Road for possible impressions? I did, yes. And were you the only criminalist from the state lab who conducted impression processing at the house itself? Yes. What were among the areas and items at the house that you remember processing for potential impressions? Uh, that day, we were directed to specific areas within the house to, to assist with the crime scene processing. So uh, I processed areas uh, of the, in the kitchen. I processed the, the right side of the refrigerator, as well as the slider door and door frame leading onto the porch, um, uh, light switches on either side of that slider door. Uh, there was an additional slider door off of that porch on, onto like a, um, a an outside porch or a deck. So I processed that uh, slider door and frame, uh, as well as um, a headboard in one of the guest bedrooms. And then downstairs, we processed items in the uh, washroom area. So there was like the washer dryer and a sink. Uh, there was a utility box, like an electrical utility cable box, as well as a toolbox in the adjoining uh, uh, workshop. Were any identifiable impressions recovered from inside the residence in the areas or the items that you examined in the residence? No. So let's switch gears from processing items for possible uh, impressions to the analysis of recovered latent impressions. And did you conduct such an analysis in this case? I did, yes. Did you recover the impressions that you analyzed, or did somebody else recover those impressions? Someone else recovered them. And uh, who recovered them? Who did that processing? Was that criminalist Rice who's testifying next? Yes, criminalist Emily Rice at the lab. So on the screen is State's Exhibit 43. And two of the items in this exhibit have been highlighted in red. We have GMH 15, which the jurors heard from before, a black trash bag. And we also have TLE 69, which the jurors heard before, an ice melter container. Are those two items that you analyzed recovered latent impressions from? Yes. And to be clear, you did not, uh, you did not analyze any recovered impressions from this clear trash bag, TLE 55, or any of its contents, right? No, I did not. The items that you did analyze are on this next slide. How many latent impressions from GMH 15 and TLE 69 did you examine? Uh, one latent impression from each item. So we're going to discuss the results of your analyst, uh, analysis shortly. Before doing that, let's discuss how you go about examining an item for latent impressions and how you go about comparing impressions and potentially making identifications. And to help with that, did you prepare a presentation for us? I did. So with that, I will give you the clicker. We've had some issues with it, so hopefully the slides will advance. If they don't, I will take it, and you can tell me when to advance.
thicker. Please. Okay. Uh, so this um, this slide shows friction-rich skin, which I mentioned earlier. So friction-rich skin is found on the palmar sides of our hands and the soles of our feet. So our feet and toes and our fingers and, and palms uh, all have this skin. And this is a picture of, of a thumb with a little bit of, of powder on it being pressed on glass to, to, to accentuate some of the uh, uh, the parts of friction-rich skin, and, and the purpose of friction-rich skin is so we can grasp items, so we don't, so we have a good hold on them, so they don't slip through our hands. So that's the purpose of of this type of skin. But um, I'll talk further about it on the, on the next slides. Uh, so as we zoom in, uh, I want to point out just a couple points about what friction skin is comprised of. Uh, it's comprised of uh, ridges, which are the high areas, uh, which are kind of like the peaks, and then the areas between the ridges are called furrows. Those are the valleys, and then. Uh, on the ridges themselves are small little areas of uh, sweat pores. So each of those circles is a separate sweat pore, uh, which are very numerous on our, on our hands and our feet. Uh, and, and those are small details that could also show up in latent impressions as well, those small little sweat pores. And talking about the, 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 as we zoom in, there's different levels of detail that we look at in a fingerprint. So uh, level one is the rich path or flow. And that was the very first picture I showed you, like an over, overview of the entire thumb. Uh, that's what le level one is. We can categorize that into patterns, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, level two is the actual path that each of those ridges take, uh, its unique path and how it reacts with its neighboring ridges. And then level three are those very small details uh, that go in, that, such as the sweat pores and, and the edges that we'll talk about on, on subsequent slides. Uh, so here's level one. Level one, the first thing we're, we look at with fingerprints is, is level one, so a bird's eye view. Um, uh, whether it's a fingerprint or a palm print, we, we look at the overall ridge flow and, and the different formations that it makes. So it helps us to classify and zero in on certain areas of a finger or a palm or a toe. And this is just showing the three different types of fingerprint patterns that are available. Uh, the entire population of the world, all fingerprints could be in one of these categories. So they're shared by a wide variety of people. So it's just a, a broad category. Uh, and identifications can't be made at this level of detail. It would have to be the next level when we zoom in. That's where we make the actual uh, identifications to people because these are very common. So at level two, we look at these different uh, formations to um, do our comparisons. So we look at bifurcations. That's where uh, a ridge splits into two different ridges. So that's a, a formation that's very important. Another one is called a ridge ending. Uh, sometimes ridges abruptly stop, and then the neighboring ridges will, will fill in the area and, and keep flowing into the pattern. And the third one is called a dot, sometimes a short ridge uh, that's kind of uh, sandwiched in between more mature ridges, and, and that's, you know, that's how it, uh, during the fetal formation process, that's how it ended its growth period, and then it, it kind of stopped. So uh, those are the, these are the areas that we uh, zero in on when doing comparisons. Uh, and if we have enough of these, uh, the next uh, picture shows a bunch more in a, in a regular fingerprint as opposed to like a cartoon, but uh, we're looking at those same formations um, when we're making our comparisons, trying to get to either an identification or an exclusion uh, to an individual. And that third level of detail, really zooming in, uh, they could, these details, if they're present, because um, they're, they're very small and sometimes distortion uh, overtakes them, but these could also support an identification as well. So if, if the fingerprint is clear enough, you know, high enough quality and quantity of, of information, uh, these things such as sweat pores and the very edges of those ridges uh, and some of the shapes that, that come about can be used for identification purposes as well. And this is just a visual of what those might look like. So when we zoom way in on a fingerprint, some of these obscurities or, or formations uh, could be seen in both latent impression and a known exemplar and be used to come to a conclusion of identification. And this next slide talks about how uh, friction-rich skin uh, and how we produce latent prints. So I talked about that a few times already. So on our hands, we're, gonna, we're constantly sweating, we're touching our face, so the oils and, and things that come out of different areas of our face or just other contaminants, whether it's dirt or grease, get onto our hands, and then we touch items and leave impressions behind. Okay, he says that as I'm sitting here touching my face, and now I'm like, let me not touch anything. Uh, so that, uh, that combination of, of sweat and other materials, fats and oils and foreign contaminants form what's called fingerprint residue. So that's the residue that's on all of our hands. So when we touch things, we're leaving fingerprints. Uh, and those could be developed and, and documented in, in an investigation. So latent impressions uh, can be um, 
developed using different means. They could be developed using chemicals. They could be developed using powders or special forensic lighting sources to, to make them fluoresce. Uh, and then we would take pictures or lists of those to memorialize them and keep them uh, documented in a forensic case. And there's lots of factors that go into leaving uh, an impression. Uh, this uh, schematic just shows how a finger would come down and touch the surface uh, and, and transfer that residue onto the surface. He has a very uh, so good any type of very hard pressure or lateral movement or, or twisting may lead to distortion. Uh, so quite often, fingerprints, fingers and palms could leave marks on objects, and those marks could be smudged. Uh, but we need to look for the fingerprints that are left that are, have high quality of, of detail left behind, so we can actually see the details to make a comparison. And this is just what typical latent impressions look like in a case. Uh, they're partials. Sometimes you can't tell what part of the hand it's from. Uh, sometimes there's limitations in um, due to the, the, the surface that it was recovered from, or the, the um, and you can see the different pressures that lead to distortions and smearing. Uh, so it's uh, not always easy to find a really pretty looking uh, fingerprint to work with. And we would take those latent impressions and compare them yeah, to standards. So they're they can be called record, uh, record impressions or exemplars. These are known recordings of certain individuals. So we would compare a latent impression, which is an unknown question impression from a scene or from a piece of evidence, and compare it to a known impression or recording from a person to see if, if both of those prints were made by the same source. And, and actually, if I can stop you here, the jurors heard from another witness yesterday about major case prints. Are these major case prints? Uh, these would be a portion of major case prints. So these. What's, what's on the screen here is called temperance, so this is like one impression of every finger, but major case imprints would also entail uh, the, the lower joints of the fingers as well as the palm, uh, fingertips, uh, so that's just a, a piece of what's called major case impressions that, are, that aren't done routinely for your everyday crimes, but for uh, major cases, they, they try to record as much detail as possible uh, from individuals. And these can be recorded either using traditional ink or, or quite often now there's digital means to capture them, which is called live scan. It's a kiosk where you could just uh, uh, record the fingers or the palms on, on just glass with a little laser underneath it and just records pictures of, of the impressions. And the basic principle, principles behind the comparison of latent prints to uh, known exemplars to come to a conclusion is based on two basic principles. Uh, it's based on the uniqueness of the formations of fr friction-rich skin as well as the permanence. Uh, so friction-rich skin is highly variable from person to person. Even identical twins who share the same DNA have different formations of, of finger, uh, friction ridges on their, on their fingers and their palms. Uh, and those arrangements have been shown scientifically to be persistent throughout one's life. So, um, it won't change, it'll grow. So as a child grows, your hands get bigger, but the formations stay in the same pattern. Uh, unless there's some sort of damage from an accident or, or a disease that would cause scarring, um, that pattern is gonna remain persistent throughout an individual's life. And the methodology that we use when we're comparing these prints, we call the ACE methodology, and it stands for Analysis, Comparison, and Evaluation. Uh, the first step analysis is information gathering. So we're studying the latent impression very closely. We're looking at, at the uh, levels of, of features that are in there, the bifurcations and the ending ridges. We're, we're plotting those out. Uh, we're analyzing any type of distortion that might be there uh, to be careful in those areas. And then once that's completed, we're gonna analyze the, the record impression for the same things. And then we're gonna do a comparison between those. So the next phase comparison is, is the searching of those fingerprint cards and those major case impressions of different people. Uh, and then when you're zeroing in on one particular print and that, has, um, that has the same levels of one and levels two details, you're gonna come to the last step, which is the evaluation step, where you have to decide uh, your conclusion, whether it's going to be exclusion, identification, or inconclusive. Those are the three possibilities when you do fingerprint comparisons. And when we make an identification of someone, this is what it means. It means that there's a sufficient amount of quality and quantity of friction ridge detail in that latent impression that it's also seen in the record impression to, come to, to be able to say that they both came from the same source. So the latent print and the record print were made by the same finger or the same palm. And, and we know who that is based on the official record of the person, uh, uh, you know, a certain person that's, that signed that card and was part of that process of recording the exemplar.
So let's go back to the actual analysis that you conducted in this case. You examined one latent impression recovered from criminalist rice from GMH 15, and also one latent impression recovered from criminalist rice from TLE 69? That's correct. Did you compare those two recovered impressions to known impressions from Timothy Vera? Yes, I did. And let's turn to your findings, and let's begin with your findings of the latent impression recovered from GMH 15, the black trash bag here on the left. And on the screen is States Exhibit 66. And if you can explain for us what we're looking at here. Uh, this is a side-by-side -side chart I made uh, in the laboratory when I was conducting uh, this comparison. Uh, I first started by doing my analysis of the latent print, which is on the left-hand side. It's labeled D, and it has, a red, it has red markings on it. So there's a series of, I think, uh, 16 red dots uh, on that impression. Uh, and those red dots are my analysis. As I'm going through that print, I'm looking for the bifurcations and the ending ridges and the dots and the, and the different levels of detail. And, and that's how I'm documenting my, my analysis of that print. And, and in the end, I concluded that it was um, suitable for identification. Uh, and I thought that it was a finger. So then I drew that uh, red arcing shape on the top. So that's a, uh, a marking that indicates that that is a, a latent print uh, that's um, of value, and I'm going to move forward to compare it to uh, someone. So then I started to uh, compare it to a fingerprint card that had, was marked uh, Timothy Verrill. Uh, as I go through that card, I realize that um, one particular finger, uh, the number four right ring finger, had a similar uh, level one um, ridge flow and pattern type, being a whirl. Uh, and then as I started to go through the various uh, red dots I made on my latent print, I could see those same features in the same orientation, in the same relative position to each other on uh, the exemplar print. Uh, so as I go through, I found all 16 of my original dots from the latent. I found them in the same spot on the exemplar. And I came to a final conclusion that that latent print marked D from exhibit GMH 15, the black trash bag, was made by Timothy Verrill's number four right ring finger. Turning next to your analysis so it's got his of the latent impression recovered from TLE 69, the container on the right. On the screen now is States Exhibit 67. Uh, what are we looking at here? And I'm using the laser pointer, but there's also a laser pointer on the desk. If you'd like to use that, it's up to you. Uh, okay. I want a laser yeah. pointer. So what are we looking at here? Uh, this is a second chart I made uh, in the lab that, that same day that I worked on it. Um, so this is the other print that I looked at. This is a latent F that was developed on uh, TLE-69. So that uh, latent is on the left-hand side. Again, I, I followed the same procedure. I followed the, the ACE methodology. So my analysis step was first. I went through that print, and I made markings you know, using the red dots. I, I was marking the, the different uh, level two uh, features that I saw, so the bifurcations and the ending ridges uh, and the dots. Uh, so I made those markings. Uh, and then I determined that that print was uh, of value for comparison purposes, so I put the, the red um, marking over top, indicating that it was a suitable finger impression. Um, and then I started to compare it to uh, the exemplar of Mark Timothy Verrill. So I, this is a different pattern type than the last uh, comparison I did. The last comparison was a whirl pattern, uh, but this particular latent D uh, has more of a looping formation in the core which is the center of the print here. And this is a delta formation. It's a triangular formation. So uh, I zeroed in on the uh, number two right index finger of Timothy Averill that, that's also a, a right slanting loop formation with a large delta formation. Uh, so as I looked at my, my 14 plotted red features on the latent, I was finding them uh, on the exemplar print in the same relative position to one another in the same location and orientation. Uh, and I ultimately came to the evaluation that um, latent F was made by the right index finger of Timothy Verrill. And lastly, looking at this chart, which is States Exhibit 62, are the results of your analysis with respect to the black garbage bag, GMH 15, and the plastic container, TLE 69, incorporated in the highlighted portions of this chart, the two identifications that you made? Yes, it is. Uh, one moment. I have no further questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Cross-examination? He did a good job with all of his, y'all know I love me a chart. 
He did a good he went job. went to the hospital, uh, not the hospital, but the, uh, the autopsy of the women? Yes, I did. And the purpose of that was to collect uh, patent prints, if you saw them? Yes, one was to look for blood imprints, so any type of, of touching of skin or maybe clothing to see if there's a, a blood print, yes, yeah, so that's a patent print. And um, when did you, did you look for any latent prints? No, I did not look for any latent prints uh, at that time. Uh, latent prints are very difficult to develop on skin, but I was just looking for blood prints at that point. Well, in addition to the body, you also had materials to look at. Yes. And one of those materials was a plastic bag. Yes. And did you examine it for latent prints? I did not. You said that what you do is you look for identifiable prints? Uh, well, that's the ultimate goal. We look for all prints, and then later on during the analysis, it will be determined if those prints are identifiable or not identifiable. So you're saying that you didn't see any prints when you read the autopsy? Right. I didn't see any prints that I, I felt were documentable, no. Well, no, my question, so there's either documented prints or there's not. Did you see any prints to be documented? No. You went to the crime scene? Yes. And by the way, at the autopsy, who did you report to? Um, I don't specifically recall. Would it be Tara, um, Tara Osborne? Yes, that sounds right. And same thing at sea, you reported to one of the te detectives that was directing the evidence collection. That's right. You didn't decide what to collect. Correct, yeah, we're there to assist uh, the investigators. And one of the things they had you do is to look at certain areas of the house to look for bloodstained prints. Correct. That was. you didn't find any. That's correct. You went to the garage to look for prints. Yes, two days later I went back to the scene and processed areas in the garage for blood prints. And did you find anything there? No, I, I documented some prints that had the initial appearance of blood, um, but they did not test positive with a blood reagent, um, so I surmise that they were probably some sort of uh, paint or stain or something like that. Thank you. Any redirect? Uh, no. May this witness be released? Yes. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Thank okay. you. Okay. side of the witness stand. I'll have you step inside, but I will ask you to remain standing. The testimony you are... Can you please introduce, uh, introduce yourself to the viewers? Good morning. My name is Emily Rice. And where do you work? I work for the State of New Hampshire Department of Safety State Police Forensic Laboratory. And uh, what is your present assignment at the lab? I'm a criminalist, too, in the laboratory. And for about how long have you worked at the state lab? Um, I've worked for the state labs for... 24 years, but the first five years were toxicology, so I've worked for the State Police Forensic Laboratory since 2005. And uh, what particular unit or units do you work in at this? Okay, again, she's lovely. I'm sure she's State super lab. smart. We're going to skip to the resume. I did all the things of a man here in the training program. I took a competency. You can explain impression processing and also a breakdown of processing versus comparison. Latent impressions first. Did you process a number of items and not find any identifiable latent impressions on them? I did. Were among the items that you processed for latent impressions and did not find any identifiable impressions some items that were found in a black garbage bag with corresponding evidence number GMH15? Um, I'm not entirely sure where they came from, but they had a GMH-15 sub-designation, so that generally means they came from that object. And what specific items with corresponding evidence number GMH15, as well as a letter, did you process for latent impressions and not find any identifiable impressions on them? Uh, GMH15A, which was portions of a cellular phone, and GMH15G, which was a cleaning fluid. If we can focus on the cell phone, GMH15A, is it unusual based on your experience that an item such as a cell phone, which is designed to be held and operated by hand and using one's thumb and fi uh, fingers, that that's processed and no identifiable latent impressions are actually found on the item? I wouldn't say it's abnormal. Um, a lot of times it's a, it's a good surface on the front to leave a, an impression. However, 
there are objects that we touch so often, like a cell phone, that um, you're essentially able to obscure the fingerprints as you touch the item over and over and over again, or you slip it into your pocket and those fragile impressions rub away. So it's not entirely s surprising that I didn't um, recover an identifiable fingerprint on the cellular phone. Were items GMH15A and GMH15G the only items that you processed for potential latent impressions and found no identifiable impressions on them? Um, I believe there was also a knife, TLE60, uh, which I processed and didn't find identifiable fingerprints. And um, at some point, I also processed some paper towels and did not find any identifiable fingerprints. So continuing on this topic of your role in processing items for latent impressions, is there a difference between processing an item and recovering a latent impression and recovering an identifiable latent impression? Uh, yes. So uh, an identifiable latent impression would have sufficient information, whether it's because of the clear quality and the quantity of information that's in that uh, recording that I would be able to compare it and perform a meaningful, meaningful comparison to uh, a record standard from an individual. Um, impressions are everywhere, however, they may not be clear enough for us to work with. In this case, did you process several items and recover from those items identifiable latent impressions? Yes, I did. So next on the screen is going to be States Exhibit 43. It shows items with evidence numbers GMH 15, TLE 55 and TLE 69. Were you able to recover identifiable latent impressions from all three of these items with those evidence numbers? Yes, I was. So let's first discuss the item with evidence number GMH 15, the photo on the far left. You just discussed that you process items that had that same evidence number, GMH15, as well as a, a letter designator as well? Yes. You uh, searched or examined two items and did not recover any identifiable latent impressions on them, one of them being a cell phone? Yes. Was your processing able to recover identif identifiable latent impressions from GMH15 itself, the black garbage bag? Yes, it was. And were you able to uh, recover as part of that processing one identifiable latent impression or multiple identifiable latent impressions? Uh, multiple identifiable impressions. And as part of your processing, did you document where those multiple identifiable latent impressions were found on GMH 15? Uh, I did record the general location of the impressions that I found. And where generally did you find those latent impressions on GMH 15? Uh, multiple different areas on the outside of GMH 15. Uh, were there also some impressions that were found inside GMH 15 as well? Um, for GMH 15, I believe there was one impression that was on the inside. However, it was not identifiable. This is like the Traconis Let's turn to the stuff. item with evidence number TLE 55. And was a clear garbage bag with that evidence number another item that you processed and found identifiable latent impressions? Yes, it was. And for TLE 55, did you find one identif identifiable latent impressions or multiple identifiable lat latent impressions? I found multiple identifiable latent impressions. And did you also, as part of your processing, again, document where those identifiable latent impressions were found on TLE 55, just like you had with GMH 15? Uh, yes, I documented the general locations. And where generally did you find identifiable latent impressions on TLE 55? Um, there were multiple impressions on the outside of TLE 55, um, as well as two impressions on the red drawstring and two impressions on the inside of TLE 55. And when you say the red drawstring, is that the portion of TLE 55 that's highlighted in red and has been enlarged to the right? It is, yes. Let's turn next to item with evidence number TLE 69, the item on the far right highlighted. And this was another item that you processed and was able to find identifiable latent impressions? Yes. And uh, did you find just one identifiable latent impression or multiple identifiable latent impressions? Uh, multiple latent impressions. And where generally did you find the latent impressions on PLE69, this plastic container? Um, one was on the label, one was on the cap, one was on the side opposite the handle, and also in the handle area. And when you say the cap, is it the top, this black portion of the container? Yes. 
And with respect to the handle, am I accurately pointing to that area with the laser pointer? Yes. I believe it was on the inside more than as you so pointed to the outside, but yes, inside. the handle. Those three items there where you found multiple identifiable latent impressions, GMH 15, TLE 55, and TLE 69, do you see those items listed on this chart, which is States Exhibit 62, highlighted on the far left column in yellow? I do. Let's switch gears now from your processing of items for potentially identifiable latent imprint, uh, impressions to your actual analyses of recovered impressions. You said uh, you also did that in this case? Performed comparisons in this case, yes. With respect to your analyses of recovered latent impressions, was that analysis limited to the latent impressions that you recovered from the three items that we just reviewed, the black trash bag, the clear trash bag, and the plastic container, or were there other items that you analyzed uh, in which identifiable impressions were found? Um, there were other items that I analyzed that had identifiable impressions also. And with respect to who found those impressions on the other items that you analyzed for comparison purposes, who conducted the processing of those items? Uh, those were processed by Anne Elizabeth Polonzi. <coughs> we're going to go over your analyses uh, more momentarily. But as to your conclusions, does States Exhibit 62 reflect latent impression identifications that you were able to make on several items? Um, it does reflect identifications I made on several items, yes. Does this chart include all of the latent impressions that you were able to identify in this case? No, it does not. Um, okay, so black trash bag. So our defendant is on the black trash bag uh, with eight palm prints and six fingerprints. He's on the plastic cap, the clear trash bag, the tape pieces, the plast another plastic bag, spray paint can, the spray paint can makes it look pretty bad because that's what they use to spray paint the windows closed so that, or windows so that you couldn't see inside. Um, and then Christine, one of the victims, hers is on uh, tape pieces and lightning box. So, but the, the, spray painting thing. Remember Josh said that those windows were not spray painted before he went that day. So we don't, we don't really know. I mean, I guess we now know that Timothy painted it, but we don't know when no. exactly. With respect to uh, wording on this chart, I'm going to focus your attention to the far right column and some terminology. Uh, fingerprints is highlighted. Uh, what do you refer to when you say fingerprints? Um, so fingerprints on this chart is grouping anything that would be uh, any of the portions of the finger. So it may not be the, the distal phalange, which is the top part that people think of as a fingerprint, but it may be one of the, the lower phalange <clears throat> on, the, on the finger. Uh, could it also be a thumb as well? It could also be a thumb, yes. We don't differentiate specifically a, finger, a thumbprint and a fingerprint. Yes. Looking at another highlighted term on this chart, uh, palm print. What do you mean by palm print? Uh, a palm print would be anything below the fingers, so not including the thumb or the fingers, but any, anything in this area of the, of the palmer surface. And lastly, looking at this chart and some highlighted terms, we have simultaneous fingers impression. Uh, fingers is not misspelled. That's how it's supposed to be, right? That is how it's supposed to be, yes. And what, what is a simultaneous fingers impression? Um, so a simultaneous impression is when more than one portion of the hand would make contact with an object at the same time. Um, there are clues in the deposition of friction ridge detail that allow us to determine that three fingers may have touched a surface at the same time. Maybe there's a slide that's associated with them so you can tell the contact all occurred at the same time. So instead of uh, breaking them up into individual fingers, we may call that entire three finger impression a simultaneous fingers impression rather than a finger, three fingerprint impressions. Now, the jurors just heard from criminal, criminalist Ostrowski about an identification that he made on one recovered latent impression from the black trash bag with corresponding evidence number GMH15, which is pointed out by the red arrow, and another identification that he made on one recovered latent impression from the plastic ice melter container with corresponding number TLE69, which is pointed out in the blue arrow. Did you also make identifications from multiple latent impressions recovered from those same two items? I did. 
Were any of the identifications that you made on latent impressions recovered from these two items of the same latent impression as criminalist Ostrowski or different latent impressions or both? Um, both. I also identified the impressions that criminalist Ostrowski identified, and then I went on and continued additional comparisons and made additional identifications uh, at a later time. As to the, these two items on the chart, GMH15 and TLE69, are the impressions identified on this far right column highlighted in yellow the total identifications made by both you and criminalist Ostrowski? They are the total identifications made by both of us, yes. So before we go over the analysis that you conducted that are indicated on this chart for the other items that are not highlighted, did you also analyze identifiable latent impressions recovered from a carpet cleaner vacuum with corresponding evidence number TLE-225? Yes, I did. And how many identifiable latent impressions were recovered from that item, the carpet cleaner? Um, there were 10 identifiable latent impressions recovered on that item. And were you able to make an identification of any of those 10 recovered impressions? Uh, yes, I was. I was able to identify eight of them. And based on the examination that you conducted, who were you able to identify as the source of eight of the 10 impressions recovered from the carpet clean? Um, eight of them were identified to Christine Sullivan. And as to the remaining two impressions on the carpet cleaner, were you able to make an identification? I was not. And why not? Um, the individuals that I performed comparisons against, uh, most of them didn't have complete friction ridge exemplars, full recordings of their known impressions, so I was inconclusive when I compared to multiple individuals. So you said that not only Christine Sullivan's exemplars did you compare to the uh, impressions found on the carpet cleaner, but multiple others as well? Correct. Uh, was one of the multiple others uh, Timothy Verrill? Yes, it was. And did you have sufficiently detailed exemplars from Timothy Verrill to exclude him as the source of the two other latent impressions that were found on the carpet clean? Yes, I did have um, clear and complete exemplars of Timothy Verrill, and I excluded him from those other two impressions on the carpet cleaner. And does that mean that Timothy Verrill never touched that carpet cleaner? Um, no, we can't really say that. You can touch an object and not leave a fingerprint behind, um, but he was not the uh, depositor of those two impressions. It doesn't mean that somebody didn't touch an object, though. You testified that eight of the ten impressions found on the carpet cleaner belonged to Christine Sullivan. Could you rule out Christine Sullivan as the source of those remaining two impressions that were unidentified? I could not rule Christine Sullivan out on the remaining two impressions. And why not? Um, I didn't have complete Friction Ridge exemplars of Christine Sullivan. I would have needed additional records uh, to complete comparisons. And to your knowledge, was her body available for such further exemplars at the time that more exemplars were determined in order to make a, a, a conclusion as to her? I don't believe her body was um, available anymore. Uh, again, before we go through the items on this chart, did you also analyze latent impressions recovered from a shovel with corresponding evidence number TLE33? Yes, I did. And how many separate latent impressions did you analyze uh, from the shovel? Um, I analyzed three impressions on the shovel. And uh, the person who actually processed those prints and were able to find them, that was criminalist Polonzi again? Yes, it was. Did all three of those latent impressions recovered by uh, criminalist or formal criminalist Polonzi turn out to be identifiable? Uh, no, one was not identifiable. Which means, again, if something is unidentifiable, what's that mean again? Uh, it means there's not enough information in the deposit of ridge detail for me to perform a comparison and potentially find the source of that impression. With respect to the two recovered impressions that were identifiable on that shovel, are their locations depicted in States Exhibit 63? Uh, yes. And as to those identifiable impressions on the shovel, were you able to make an identification of either one of them? Um, yes, I was able to make an identification of a fingerprint, um, but there was also a palm print that I wasn't able to identify. With respect to the fingerprint that you were able to identify, who were you able to conclude was the source of that identifiable latent fingerprint? Uh, the fingerprint was identified to Buddy Seymour. As to the second ide identifiable impression on the shovel, I believe you said a palm print, were you able to make an identification of that impression? I was not. And again, why not? Um, the Many of the records that I um, had for individuals to be compared were not complete enough for me to make a, a final conclusion. 
And I guess if uh, we can talk about that a little bit, we heard about major case prints. Were most of the exemplars that you received not major case prints? Most of the exemplars, exemplars that I received were not major case exemplars. So when you say incomplete or insufficient, they just didn't have enough of the print details like a major case uh, print might have? Um, correct. So we typically call them complete friction ridge exemplars, um, and they really record the entire surface. Uh, that's the goal, to record the entire surface of the palm, the fingers, the sides of the fingers, everywhere that you have friction ridge detail. Um, even in our live scan capabilities that we have today, it's very difficult to capture all of that information with, um, without taking pen and paper um, or ink and paper and multiple copies of somebody's hands. Focusing again on the second identifiable latent impression, the palm print that you were not able to identify. Even though you weren't able to identify the source of that palm print, were you able to exclude several people as a source of that impression? Um, yes, I was. Could you rule out or exclude John Seymour as the source of that second identifiable latent impression that was found on the shovel, the, the palm print? I could not exclude or identify um, Buddy Seymour, John Buddy Seymour. And uh, we refer to him as John Seymour, but you also realize he has a nickname called Buddy? I think um, some of the paperwork said Buddy, yes. And why was it you were not able to exclude uh, Buddy John Seymour as the source of the second, the palm impression on the shovel? Um, the records for his impressions didn't reach high enough up, up into the palm area. Uh, the friction ridge detail appears to be right here at the base of the fingers, um, and it's kind of often not captured in recordings, so I just needed a little bit more information at the top of the record. And with respect to you needing a little more information, you're aware that John Seymour has been deceased for several years, and so additional prints could not be obtained from him? Um, I don't believe I was aware at the time, but I became aware after, yes. You said that uh, several people were actually excluded as the possible source of that palm impression on the shovel? Um, I know of at least one. I would have to reflect on my notes in order to determine who all of the people were that were excluded. Well, let me ask it this way. Was Timothy Verrill among the people who you excluded as the source of that second identifiable impression on the shovel, the, the palm print? Yes, I excluded Timothy Verrill from having made that palm print impression on the shovel. And similar question to the question I asked you about the carpet cleaner. Does that mean that Timothy Verrill never touched that shovel? Uh, no, I can't tell if somebody didn't touch an object. So next on the screen is States Exhibit 44. Did you also conduct analyses of potentially identifiable latent impressions that was recovered by former criminalist Balonzi for items with unique evidence numbers TLE 54, TLE 55, TLE 55D, TLE 55G, TLE 55K, TLE 55, I'm sorry, TLE 56, and TLE 57, which are all seen on this photograph. Uh, yes. With respect to potentially identifiable latent impressions that we recovered from these items, did you compare those recovered impressions with the known impressions of various people, including Timothy Verrill and Christine Sullivan? I did. Based on the analysis that you conducted, were you able to determine the source of latent impressions recovered from evidence numbers TLE 54, TLE 55, TLE 55D, TLE 55G, TLE 55K, TLE 56, and TLE 57? Um, yes, with the exception of one impression on TLE 55G. Uh, the conclusions that you made? Are they summarized in States Exhibit 62? Um, the conclusions with respect to identifications are listed on States Exhibit 62, and then there's just one additional unidentified impression that's on one of the tape pieces. So the tape pieces is TLE 55G that you talked about? Yes. And there was one unidentifiable impression on TLE 55G? Uh, there's one unidentified but identifiable impression on the tape pieces um, that I excluded as having made, been made by Timothy Verrill, but I did not exclude Christine Sullivan. And was that for the same reason that you discussed before? You didn't have sufficient exemplars for Ms. Sullivan's prints? Yes, I didn't have complete enough <clears throat> records of her impressions to complete a comparison on that one last impression. So let's discuss your conclusions as they're summarized on this chart. And with respect to those conclusions, did you provide comparison photos of a few of the identifiable impressions and known exemplars to illustrate how you conducted your analysis and came to your conclusions? Um, yes, I did. 
So, Judge, we have about 10 more minutes, 15 more minutes. Do you want to continue or you want to take a break? Well, why don't we take our break now because we've been going for about an hour and 15 minutes and we'll break until 11.25. So that's less than 15 minutes and then we'll work until 12.15. Okay, so 11.25 back in the courtroom. Thank you. Please rise. Okay. Um, we are going to, what time is it? Three o'clock or four o'clock, depending on where you're at. Um, We'll probably go for a little bit more until he finishes, and then we'll save the rest of this for tomorrow, because I've, I've got to get... I'm so... I know y'all like to do the live trials and the speed trial, and so I am doing it. <laughs> but I've got so much that I'm still trying to... Um, that I've still got to get done. So um, I'm trying to speed trial and fit it all in um, and give you what you want. Uh, but I am, oh, Aaron Hack says we missed a couple things yesterday uh, that we skipped. Okay. So they did find prints on those two trash bags, but they skipped many trash bags in the same areas. They skipped the trash bags on the porch and in the upper garage. So they skipped those trash bags. We didn't see that because they skipped those trash bags and we skipped the rest of those last 30 minutes. Um, it's one o'clock here. I know. I'm sorry. It's it's three o'clock here, and I have. Um, I told y'all some of my exciting stuff that's coming up. I have a couple deadlines that I have to get get stuff in. So, I am. Um, I'm sorry, but uh, we can start a little bit early tomorrow. Um, um, instead of starting at noon like we've been doing, we can start probably closer to ten, and then. Um, speed trial so that way by the time we finish whatever's left from today and then tomorrow we should be catching up about um about uh real time and then and then hopefully be caught up um friday morning i am recording the cup of justice episode but i think i'm supposed to be done with that by like 10 or 10 30 ish so we should be able to start a little bit earlier than two. Uh, they also did not pull surveillance from two or three cameras. The defense pointed those out and asked why. And she said, basically, not my job. Not my job. Good answer. Except for in a courtroom, right? Um, thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We missed it because I'm trying, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get caught up. I'm trying. Does it, uh, you know, it's interesting now too, like after hearing the stuff about Dean and all of the, um, all of the information about him and his, um, extracurricular activities and whatnot, uh, it does kind of, um, make you look at this a little bit different or it makes me look at this a little bit different anyway, so. We'll probably finish with, maybe finish with this witness. Let's see how long she goes. Forever. She goes forever. She goes forever and ever. Um, yeah, maybe not. Maybe we won't finish with this witness. We'll see how far we can get. Please rise, Jury Anchor. Please be seated. Oops. Hinkley, you can resume when you're ready. Before we took the morning break, we were looking at States Exhibit 62. And we were talking about the comparisons that you did of identifiable impressions found on TLE 54, TLE 55D, TLE 55G, TLE 55K, TLE 56, and TLE 57. And I wanted you to talk about your conclusions and the next few slides will have some photos to help you explain what you did. And we're first looking at a photograph from State's Exhibit 32J, which depicts TLE 56. 
is this next slide, States Exhibit 78C, a comparison photo for one of the identifiable impressions found on that spray paint can that you found matched Timothy Verrill? Um, yes, this is a comparison chart that I created uh, marking my findings, um, ultimately determining uh, an identification of the palm print to the right palm of Timothy Verrill. And so if you can explain for us what we're looking at in this slide and how these photographs help you make the conclusion that you made. Um, sure. So on the left-hand side, um, that is the latent impression or a portion of the latent impression, and I've um, enlarged it on my computer screen in Photoshop. Um, I've also um, done digital processing to, if it's a color image, I may turn it to black and white just because it's a little easier to compare uh, black and white ridges to black and white exemplars, which for the most part are our exemplars are black and white. Um, there is a large portion I have... Uh, this is the hypothenar area of a palm print, and this is the thenar area of a palm print. Um, and that's the hypothenar is the under the little finger, and the thenar is under the thumb. There's some characteristic creasing and ridge flow um, that I'm used to seeing in those areas, so it helps me orient the impression. And at first, I'm just doing an analysis on the impression, determining is it a finger, is it a palm? Um, do I have enough information that I think I could identify it? And I'll mark features that I'm seeing so that when I later bring up an uh, exemplar impression, I can compare the features that I've seen in just the analysis portion to the known impression. Um, so on the, the left is the latent impression, and the, the right side is a cropped portion of the known right palm of Timothy Verrill. And the red dots that you can maybe faintly see are um, me marking some of the level two features or the minutia, the ending ridges, bifurcations that I'm observing in the latent, and then comparing to the, um, the, the known exemplar to see if they're in agreement or if they're in disagreement. So this small area here, it may be hard, hard to tell that, but that area is in agreement with this area right here. And then it's, it's very hard for me to see the dots on here and do a laser pointing, but what I'll do is uh, mark, mark a feature that I see that's in agreement between the two, and then I'll count ridges up in the same direction, so up and to the right or up and to the left, and determine if I see another feature that's in the known, the exemplar impression, I'm sorry, the uh, latent impression, and determine if I also see it in the, the latent impression. And by continuously um, determining the spatial relationship of those features, seeing if they're in agreement or if they're in disagreement, I can come to a conclusion. If they're in agreement, the conclusion uh, would be an identification. If there's a disagreement of those features, then um, I would be excluding that individual. And here, this was an identification, correct? In this, this is an identification. Uh, what's the AZ labeled on the bottom left? The, um, the line on the bottom gives me, a, a, I, I'm drawing, uh, a line to denote the orientation that I think the palm is in the upward direction like this as shown and then the AZ is the latent identif identifier. Um, I went through the alphabet starting with A, A, B, C, D, all the way to Z and then started over. There was a lot of latent impressions in this case so I started over um, with AA, AB, all the way to AZ so this would be the uh, 54th latent impression in the case. Let's turn to an item with evidence number TLE55G on the screen is a photo from States Exhibit 32L, and 55G has been highlighted in red. Next on the screen are States Exhibits 78A and 78B. These comparison photos for two of the identifiable impressions found on TLE 55G that you determined matched Timothy Verrill? Um, yes, those are comparison charts that I used to document what I was seeing, and my ulti ultimate conclusion was that they were an identification to Timothy Verrill. So let's look at each one of these two comparisons. We'll start with the one on the left here. So what are we looking at on this slide, and how did it help in your analysis? Um, so on the left-hand side is the latent impression. It's latent impression AQ. Um, it's just a unique identifier that it was given. Uh, this latent impression is on tape. It was developed with um, a fluorescent dyeing material, uh, so I did convert it to black and white in order to be able to compare black ridges to black ridges in a known. Um, but prior to looking at the known, I did an analysis of the features that I was seeing in, in the latent impression. It's a little bit, um, uh, it's a flexible surface being taped, so there's um, some areas that you can see where the tape is folding over a little bit. Um, but this is the ridge detail that I'm talking about all the way down to here. This is all one impression. Um, 
and I'm initially analyzing to determine if it's a finger or a palm. Then I'm marking the features that I'm seeing, determining if it's identifiable. If I determine it's identifiable, it'll move on to comparison. Um, and then I'm going to compare those features that I observed in analysis and compare them to record impressions of known individuals. So in this case, the identification was made to Timothy Verrill, and I have um, plotted what's in agreement, the features that I'm seeing in agreement between the two. Um, so this area up here, it might be a little bit twisted in the counterclockwise direction, but it is the same as the features that I'm seeing here in the tip area of the right, right ring finger of Timothy Verrill. And then this information down here and down towards um, the bottom of the latent, all of these features are also in agreement between um, the latent impression and the known uh, number four finger of Timothy Verrill. I just used two impressions of the same finger, so two known impressions because they each recorded um, a little bit more information either from side to side or from forward to backward. So it's not uncommon to use multiple impressions of the same finger uh, of a known impression to uh, come to a conclusion. And if we now look to 78B, uh, if you can explain what we're looking at here and again, how that helped your analysis. <clears throat> uh, sure, so AV is a different latent. It, this one was developed on the, the sticky side of the tape um, and developed with um, material that we paint onto the, the sticky side. So I analyzed the impression to determine if it's identifiable. Like as before, I marked features that I saw in a, in, um, throughout the impression that I would help to determine um, a conclusion later when I did a comparison. Uh, but initially, I'm just marking the features. The red dots are some level two details that I'm seeing that I want to use as target groups in order to compare to record, other record impressions. Uh, so once I'm done with my analysis, just based on the latent impression on the left, I'll pull up a comparison um, image. I'll determine if there's an agreement or disagreement of those features. So uh, this one is pretty easy to see, I think. Um, it's a, what we call a short ridge. So it really is just a line, a small line in the middle of those ridges. Um, and it's in agreement right here. And then what I'll do is count um, up from this short ridge. I'm counting one ridge, two ridges, and then I have another one that's, bif that's ending or bifurcating right there. And that minutia is, sorry for my shaky hands, it's really hard to keep it nice and straight. Um, so that's that same minutia in agreement. And I'll do this continuously, keep continuing to count the ridges until I reach another feature, and then I can assess if it also is in agreement. So I did this systematically throughout all the impressions to come to the conclusions. And your analysis for the many other identifiable recovered latent impressions that you examined, was it similar to what you just described for the jurors in the last three photos, that we, slides that we saw, states 78A through C? Yes, it was. With respect to your analysis of recovered latent impressions on the three comparison slides that we just looked at, you are able to make a conclusion as to identity? Yes. Were you able to make a conclusion as to identity for many other latent impressions that you analyzed? Yes, I was. Going back to State's Exhibit 62, your ultimate conclusions with respect to latent impressions that you looked at for items processed by former criminalist Polonzi, evidence numbers TLE 54, TLE 55D, TLE 55G, TLE 55K, TLE 56, and TLE 57, are they summarized on this chart again? Yes, they are. And so going to <laughs> TLE 54, what was your conclu conclusion with respect to the latent impressions that were found on that item? Uh, the identifiable latent impression um, was identified to Timothy Verrill. It was a portion of his palm, and it also continued up into a finger. What was your conclusion with respect to latent impressions found on the item with evidence number TLE 55D? Uh, that latent impression was identified to Christine Sullivan. What was your conclusion with respect to latent impressions, uh, identifiable latent impressions on the item with evidence number TLE 55G? Um, one identifiable latent impression was not identified to anybody. Uh, the, I didn't complete comparisons on it. Um, but otherwise, four latent impressions were identified to Timothy Verrill, and five latent impressions were identified to Christine Sullivan. What was your conclusion with respect to latent impression on the item with evidence number TLE 55K? Uh, that latent impression was identified to Timothy Verrill. What was your conclusion with respect to latent impressions on the item with uh, evidence number TLE 56? Both of those impressions were identified to Timothy Verrill. And what was your conclusion with respect to latent impressions on the item with evidence number TLE 57? All of those were identified to Timothy Verrill. So the items that we just reviewed were processed by former criminalist Balanzi and analyzed by you. I next want to turn to items that were both processed as well as analyzed by you. 
and items from which you are able to identify the source of a latent impression. There again, evidence numbers GMH 15, TLE 55, and TLE 69 depicted on this photo? Yes. Did your uh, identification analysis proceed along the same general lines that you outlined earlier with the slides? Yes, it did. Your conclusion as to impressions on those three items, GMH 15, TLE 55, and TLE 69, are they also summarized on States Exhibit 62? Yes, they are. What was your conclusion with respect to latent impressions that were found on the item with evidence number GMH 15? All of the identifiable impressions were identified to Timothy Verrill. The total number of identified impressions seen below this photo, uh, 6 plus 8, 14, does that include all of yours as well as a separate identification made by criminalist Ostrowski? It does. Going back to your processing of this black garbage bag, were you able to make identifications for all of the identifiable latent impressions that you recovered from this item? I was. And who was the source of each one of those recovered impressions based on your analysis? Uh, Timothy Verrill was identified as having made all of them. Now put another way, were there any identifiable latent impressions recovered from this black garbage bag that did not belong to Timothy Verrill? No. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna stop here. Um, and we will do this part and the rest of it, um, the rest of today's stuff and then uh, tomorrow's stuff, we will work on it tomorrow. Um, or not work on it. <laughs> so he's saying work on it because I've got so much I'm working on. Uh, we will watch the rest of it tomorrow. Um, so we're gonna call it a day for today so I can get some other stuff done. Uh, this is, um, yeah, Holly says, I know that this can be boring, but it's crucial to the evidence that the, that will be used by the jury to decide. Yeah, this stuff is like, um, you know, it's, it's some of that stuff that it's very tedious for them to get through it. Um, it's because they can't just say, hey, fingerprints were on this and this and this. We didn't check this and this and this. You know, they can't go through it like that. It has, it's, it's such a process of going through on having to ask very specific questions and lead them through the questions without leading them, like in the legal sense. So it is very tedious, but of course it is stuff that is, you know, um, that is gonna be, uh, like you said, considered by the jury. So important stuff. So, um, I am, <laughs> puts pencils away, yes. Um, I am going to pause it here. We will pick up right here tomorrow. Um, I've got it set for, I don't have any meetings or anything in the morning. So, um, I've got us set for, um, I don't even remember. I just set it up and I've already forgotten, um, I think I, I either did it for 10.15 or 10.30, my time, um, central time. So, uh, but tomorrow, uh, we don't have other hearings and other things that are going on too. So tomorrow we can get caught up on all of it. So that way we'll be back on like regular time. Um, so that's the plan for tomorrow. Sound good? Sound like a plan? I've got it set up to where it will portal you over there so you can hit notify me so that you make sure that you get your notification tomorrow. And hopefully the internet gods will shine down on us and we won't have any more issues where, look at her stretching. She she can tell my voice. She thinks that she's going outside, but it's pouring rain, so she's not going outside. Um, but Hopefully tomorrow the internet gods will shine down on us and we won't have any more issues and it won't kick everybody out and it won't boot me out of my whole internet neighborhood and all that good stuff. So fingers crossed for an easier day tomorrow. I appreciate all of y'all. Thank you so much for hanging out. Go rest your eyeballs and get ready to listen to the rest of the evidence tomorrow and I will see y'all then. I gotta go. I can't. I can't stick around here forever. Everybody was wonderful. Everybody behaved. Everybody's always so nice to me. Just love your channel. And...
Goodbye, good people. Now, how the heck do I get out of here?